Sergeant, start your recordings. PC recording is up. Recording to the cloud, all set. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on criminal justice. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time. Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones elect and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Powers, we are ready to begin. Thank you and welcome today to the Criminal Justice Committee hearing. I am City Councilman Keith Powers, Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, and I'm just getting my script up as we speak. Uh, I'm City Council members and I'm glad that everyone, uh, City Councilman Keith Powers, Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, and glad that you could join us today for our hearing on the update on the borough based jails plan. As many of you know, in 2016, former New York City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Favorito called for the creation of an independent commission to examine closing jails on Rikers Island. The commission unanimously recommended closing all jails on Rikers Island, and in 2017, Mayor de Blasio agreed. This session, the council, working with the administration, adopted the borough-based jails plan, and due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the plan has been pushed back but the administration has worked earnestly to begin the process of procuring design build teams to construct all four new facilities. And according to the most recent report from the mayor's office of criminal justice, the administration is on schedule to meet the new deadline of August, 2027. Our existing jails are literally falling apart and have contributed to the dangerous situation on Rikers Island. Our existing jails do not allow for the efficient deployment of staff, are not conducive to programming and make, and make court appearances and visitation difficult. I'll also add there, uh, even on our hottest days, there's not air conditioning and the conditions there uh, at all times uh, remain way outdated in terms of providing the basic human services to individuals. This is why the council and administration must continue to work together to complete the borough based jail plan as quickly as possible and to ensure the new facilities are, are designed to be humane, safe, and efficient. Today, we are here seeking an update on the progress to close and transfer the Rikers Island to DCAS and the status of each of the four borough-based facilities. We also want an update on the points of agreements that were negotiated as part of the borough-based jails plan. We want to hear more about the design of the new jails and how they will better serve those in custody, staff, and the community. And lastly, lastly we want to know how the administration plans to reduce the jail population and change the culture within the Department of Corrections. With that said, I want to thank the committee staff for putting together this hearing, and I'd like to acknowledge all the members who are here today, and I'm going to go through the list here. I see we have Council Member Bob Holden. We have, uh, as I look through this, uh, we have Council Member Amprey Samuel, and I think we'll be joined by more shortly that I will acknowledge. I'm sorry if I missed anyone for the time being. Uh, with that being said, I will hand it over to the committee staff now, the committee council, to go over some procedural items. Thank you. I am Agatha Mavropoulos, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Criminal Justice. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to testify, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. We will first hear testimony from the Department of Correction, followed by testimony from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, followed by a period of question and answer from the committee members to the administration. We will then hear testimony from the Board of Correction, followed by a period of question and answer from committee members. We will then hear from the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Committee members will be limited to three minutes, including responses. I will now administer the oath to all members of the administration. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these, this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? First Deputy Commissioner Stanley Richards. I do. Executive Director of the Borough-Based Jail System, Sasha Ginsberg. 
yield. Bureau Chief of Facility Operations, Ada Presley. I yield. Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. I yield. Associate Commissioner for Borough-Based Jail Program, Rebecca Clough. I do. Senior Project Manager for the Borough-Based Jail Program, Public Buildings, Lindsay Shields. I do. Director of Criminal Justice, Marco Soler. I do. Senior Advisor at MOFJ, America Canis. I think America is having a I problem do. with her audio. She will do that later. Thank you. I do. Oh, Executive, you Executive Director of Capital Projects, Nadine Mollin. I do. Thank you. Um, Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs of Correctional Health Services, Jeanette Merrill. I do. Thank you. And Executive Director of the Board of Correction, Maggie Egan. I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from the administration. First Deputy Commissioner Stanley Richards, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Powers and the Committee on, Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Stanley Richards, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner of Programs and Training at the Department of Corrections, and I oversee the borough-based jail system at DOC. As mentioned, I'm joined here by Sasha Ginsberg, Executive Director of the Borough-Based Jail System, Ada Presley, Borough Chief of Facility Operations, and Dana Lass, Chief of Staff. With all the challenges the Department faces today, I am thrilled to spend some time to talk to you about the vision we have for the future. In the spring of 2017, the city committed to closing, closing the jails on Rikers Island and creating a network of modern, humane, borough-based jails. The city is currently on track to build the borough-based jail system and completely close Rikers Island by 2027. This smaller jail system built upon a foundation of dignity and respect, will house a total population of no more than 3,300 people, reflecting the reality that we can keep far fewer people in jails without compromising safety of our city. The borough-based jail system is, at its core, a jail population reduction plan. We are dramatically shrinking New York City's jail capacity. Currently, the department operates eight active jails that have approximately 11,000 beds. Under this plan, we will have four jails that will house a total population of 3,300 people. In addition, the plans for the borough-based jail system are informed by a focus on the dignity of everyone, everyone in our jails, the people in custody, the officers who keep them safe, and the community members who keep those in custody connected to our society and help them transition back home. Making jails more humane is not about a trade-off between people in custody and officers. It's just not. It's about creating a culture of dignity, rehabilitation, of respect for everyone inside our jails. That's why the new facilities will be designed to foster the safety and well being of everyone, providing space for quality education, health, and therapeutic programming. They are grounded in an understanding of the context and continuity of people's lives, which requires supportive services such as health care and education, both inside the facility and linked to the community. The plans recognize that most of the people in our jails are going back to their neighborhoods and prioritize the need to reintegrate them successfully upon their release. The borough-based jail system will strengthen connections to families, attorneys, 
supports medical and mental health care and faith and community-based organizations. Being closer to home and transit will enhance the network of supports for people who are detained and help prevent them from coming back into the system. While we are still working very hard every day to address the challenges we have right now, I'm at DOC to look toward the future. And every day that we fight the crisis we're facing, I'm heartened by the vision that so many city leaders have worked to put forward that truly reflect the values of our city. We want to, we want to thank the tireless work of advocates, formerly incarcerated people, and those who have been directly impacted by Rikers Island, including our officers and our non-uniformed staff. The city has advanced the plans through a dedicated interagency team and through cooperation with the council, which has provided critical support throughout this process. DOC works with Correctional Health Services, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and the Department of Design and Construction to ensure the plans for the new jails reflect the new vision for our jails, one that is safe and humane, one that works for the people whose lives it touch one that makes people leave better off than when they arrive. We have a moment in this city to ensure that the jails that we create reflect the values of humanity first, humanity for our officers, the conditions that they work in speak to the values we place on the job that they do, the humanity of those who are detained and the values of the community from which they come. We are no longer in a moment where isolation, minimalization are the, the, the call of the day. We have an opportunity to build a better system of accountability and fairness built on the humanity of everybody. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Sasha Ginsberg, who is the executive director of the Borough Based Jail System. Thank you, Stanley. Good morning, Chair Powers and the Committee on, on Criminal Justice. My name is Sasha Ginsberg, and I'm the Executive Director of the Borough-Based Jail System at the Department of Corrections. Thank you for having us here to provide an update on the plans to close Rikers Island and build the new Borough-Based Jail System. The last time we were before Council to discuss this project was during the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, or EULA, in October of 2019. Since the council approved our ULIP application on October 17, 2019, we have been working diligently on moving this process, on moving this project forward to ensure we can enclose, we can close Rikers Island as quickly and efficiently as possible. We went into the ULIP process with a master plan for the four facilities that determined the rough square footage, height, and density of the building. In the master plan, we laid out a vision for the new facilities that includes robust services provided for people in custody, a safe and comfortable place for staff to work, and buildings that integrate well into the surrounding communities. During ULER, we refined this program in close consultation with Council, and the resulting height, square footage, and density of all four facilities were reduced dramatically to account for the reduction in, the project, in projected incarcerated population. The city team has been working within these ULIP requirements that were determined in conjunction with the City Planning Commission and the City Council. As you may know, the ULIP approvals bind us to a maximum height, 295 feet in Manhattan and Brooklyn, 195 feet in Queens and the Bronx, a maximum square footage, floor area ratio, which measures the building density, the number of parking spaces, beds, and where the entrance and exits are. Within these constraints, we have developed a detailed program for these buildings that embodies the vision that FDC Richards laid out in his testimony. The Borough-based jails will be fundamentally different from the jails we have today. There are three core components that define our program and improve upon the facilities and conditions that we currently see. Better housing units, better cells, and better operations. First, I will discuss the better housing unit. We will on every housing unit will be set every excuse me, every housing unit will be centered around a large day room that will serve many functions, 
and dedicated zone with direct access to an outdoor recreation space. And every housing area will be one or two multi-purpose rooms, two interview rooms, a quiet room, specific areas for dining and passive lounging, and areas for programming and health services. The goal of bringing services to people in custody, rather than bringing people in custody to services, is to reduce movement throughout the facility and to ensure, ensure consistent access to programming that is not interrupted by incidents in the rest of the facility. There will also still be congregate programming spaces, including classrooms, vocational education, chapel, gym, and law and leisure libraries. In addition, the furnitures in the day rooms will be comfortable and will provide different furniture for different uses. For example, dining areas will have circular tables with removable chairs, and leisure areas will have couch-like seating. The finishes of the spaces will be designed for maximum noise absorption and to be soothing for people in custody. We are requiring acoustic ceiling tiles to be included and doors to have a wood green finish. Importantly, very importantly for this program, there will be no bars throughout the entire facility. In addition, another key component of our program are therapeutic housing units. Approximately 50% of the total housing units throughout the borough based jail system will be therapeutic units. These units will have increased programming and clinical spaces and will be co staffed between DOC and CHS staff, similar to the current CAPS and PACE units. They will serve people with medical, mental health, or substance use needs. In addition, on every housing unit floor, there is a cluster space that will be accessible by all the housing units on that floor. The cluster spaces include additional programming space, including more multi-purpose rooms and interview rooms, a barber shop, de-escalation rooms, decontamination showers, and additional administrative space for DOC and CHS staff. Now I wanna talk about the better stuff. All furniture and materials used throughout the new jail will be as comfortable as possible. In the cells, we will be using detention grade plastic furniture that is both comfortable and secure. Every cell will have a bed, desk, and chair, and a window with a direct view to the outside. This will allow people in custody to see the changing light and ceiling. In every cell, people in custody will be able to control an air vent to allow fresh air into the cell. In addition, there will be operable blinds within, the, within each window to control light into the cells. Now we'll move to better, the better operations of the new facilities. In the new jails, rather than having a single intake space that serves numerous and oftentimes competing functions like in the current jails, the borough-based jails will have a dedicated new admission space that will only serve people who are being admitted to the facility. There will be other and dedicated spaces for release, court production, and the de-escalation of incidents. Currently, all of these functions occur in the intake spaces, which were not designed to accommodate them. And as a result, intake can feel incredibly chaotic and in the wrong circumstances. And in, in an acute crisis, sorry, in, in the wrong circumstances, can lead to an acute crisis, such as the ones we experienced in September. Therefore, instead of the large holding pens that we have now, we are creating an area where people will wait comfortably in chairs in an open seating area as they go through the DOC admissions process. Admission to jail can be traumatizing, and our goal is to make the new admission spaces feel as calm as possible. Furthermore, Transporting people throughout a facility to a central intake area following an altercation can be unsafe for both staff and people in custody. In the new facilities, we are placing dedicated de-escalation rooms on every housing unit floor to minimize movement in these instances. Separating the current intake functions into dedicated spaces is just one of the many ways that the new facilities will be designed to eliminate some of the operational problems caused by the outdated infrastructure in our current jails. Furthermore, the new jails will employ a new model of supervision called direct supervision. DOC officers will supervise the housing units using direct supervision, supervision 
which is considered to be the best practice for correctional operations. Direct supervision means that there is one officer assigned to each housing unit, and they have an open officer station placed in the middle of the day. Through effective design, officers will have sight lines to all areas in the housing unit and will be moving throughout the unit during their shift. We will also have local service providers staffing the welcoming public lobbies of the new facilities so people in the community can come in and access resources directly in the building. These providers will also help people who are released from the facilities access services such as transportation, housing, tra and transitional employment, among others. The lobby will also have comfortable furniture with a dedicated children's play area, stroller parking, and lactation room. Now we'll move on to discuss our current timeline. The city began the process of procuring design and construction services for facility dismantling, site preparation, and construction of the four borough based jail immediately following the 2019 UFO approval. The city received state approval to execute this project using design build project delivery, which will allow us to construct the jails and close Rikers Island by 2027. We would not have been able to do this if we had been constrained by the antiquated design bid build lowest bid method the city was forced to use to deliver most of its capital portfolio. As I noted, the city's Department of Design and Construction began the required procurement process for this program just under two years ago. By March of this year, we had a design build team on board for the demolition of a municipal parking lot in construction of a new parking and community space in Queens. The Queens garage and community space is on schedule to be completed by late 2022, just three years after the start of procurement. A project of this magnitude would normally take six years or more to complete. Procurement is well underway for the construction of the new facilities in Queens, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. To ensure the broadest industry participation, each site will have two separate procurements for site dismantling and preparation, and a second for the design and construction of the new facility. By the end of 2021, Dismantle and site preparation contracts will be registered on all four sites and site work will begin in early 2022, paving the way for the delivery of smaller and more humane facilities to be in place by 2027. In September 2021, the city released an RFQ for the construction and design of the four facilities. The Manhattan facility RFP will be released in December 2021 with the other three boroughs following shortly thereafter. All four design and construction contracts will be registered by the end of 2023. Completing an unprecedented $8.5 billion program by 2027 requires tremendous co collaboration, and we have been working in close coordination with MOFJ, City Hall, the Office of Management and Budget, the Public Design Commission, the Department of City Planning, and others. It is truly a team effort. In addition, since the inception of the Borough Based Jails Project, throughout the UF process, and since its approval, we have been working closely with all relevant stakeholders. Local community members, advocates, formerly incarcerated individuals, DOC and CHS staff, and people who are currently in DOC custody. In addition to convening the neighborhood advisory committees to discuss the concerns of the local community, we, conduct, we conducted design workshops with the communities of the four jail sites, justice advocates, formerly incarcerated individuals, people currently in DOC custody, and DOC and CHS staff. The results from these workshops inform the design guidelines for the facilities, and we are continuing these conversations as the process continues. Before I close, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your interest in our work and for the Council's partnership on the Borough Based Jail System. While the elements of the plan I have mentioned are only some of the key features of the new facilities, they are illustrative of the new model of incarceration that these facilities will employ. We are happy to explain the program in further detail and answer any specific questions about how else these facilities will be designed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Director Stoller. You may begin when ready. 
And just briefly before we go on, I just want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Van Bramer and Council Member Rivera. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Marcus Soler, and I am the Director of Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I'm joined today by America Canas, Senior Advisor for Justice Initiatives, and Nadine Malek, Executive Director for Capital Projects. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the progress of our efforts to close Rikers in order to create a smaller, fairer jail system with four borough based jails. Since the start of this administration and from the inception of the Borough Based Jails Project, my office, MACJ, has helped to lead the broader policy initiatives that act got together with the project and has advised the mayor on evidence based best practices for transforming our current jail system into one that is modern, safe, and more humane. One necessary objective of the borough-based jail plans is to reduce the size of the city jail's populations to 3,300. We believe that despite the challenges posed by the pandemic, we are on course to meet this goal by 2026. New York City currently has the lowest incarceration rate of all the large cities in the United States. And that has been the case all through this administration. We have seen historic declines over the course of this administration accelerating the pace of reduction of the jail population by decreasing the population from over 11,000 in 2014, sorry, in 2013, to about 5,500 or less, which is today. We are committed to the goal of the borough-based jails and therefore are employing the strategies and investing in the tools that reduce the need for pretrial incarceration. Alternatives to incarceration, supervised release, effective reentry services and a fully functional court system are vital to the reduction of the city jail population. Allow me to share with you a bit more about these programs and initiatives and how they continue to further the administration's goal to reduce unnecessary incarceration. Supervised release. In 2016, the city launched supervised release citywide offering judges the option of releasing appropriate and eligible defendants under specific supervisor, supervisory conditions. This is a program that has been test, uh, evaluated both internally and externally with no changes to a, the FTA race, the race to which the flight risk or the rearrest rate and has proven to be crucial in reducing the prey, the jail population. A, Overall, the number of people projected to serve by supervised release has increased from 3,300 at its inception in 2016 to close to 2,000 in 2022 and going forward. The current overall value of these contracts is more than $72 million annually. MACJ released an RFP in September 2021 to solicit providers to continue this service moving forward and for the next few years. Alternatives to incarceration. Alternative to incarceration programs are core mandated diversion programs that provide participants with supportive services in their communities in a state of a jail or prison sentence. Alternatives to incarceration programs are key, are a key component of the city's investment in reducing the course reliance on incarceration for jail for as long as short-term just sentences. MACJ currently has $35 million in contracts in fiscal year 21 with 15 nonprofit organizations to run a total of 24 alternative to incarceration programs throughout the city. In 2017, the city increased its investments, increased its investments in ITI programs to serve approximately 5,500 people, as well as to provide additional behavioral health services to alternative incarceration participants and housing resources for women enrolled in ITI programs. In 2020, the city expanded his ITI programs even further to divert more people, as well as to provide additional supportive services to more fully address participant needs. Reentry. One of the key elements 
of the public safety approach of the administration has since to reduce the high recidivism rate. We have seen that in recent years, the recidivism rate has decreased from over 40% over to 36%. While this sort of action is encouraging, the number of people who do return to jails and to prison is still too high. We are currently making significant new investments in services and are reshaping the way we deliver those services to ensure that they are effective. These investments are effective. It is investments and effective deployment of the services will be key in reducing the return rate further. Mark J, for instance, expanded his reentry program to improve the transition and release planning services to individuals in Rikers. The city invested $20 million into this new program, which builds upon the success of the Jails to Jobs reentry services which was launched in 2018. Upon release, individuals work with reentry mentors who help facilitate all aspects of reentry on an individualized basis. The reentry mentors develop relationships with release individuals to encourage participation in relevant services and programs. Our providers are currently implementing many of these wraparound services and providing additional support. Additionally, in order to maximize safety at the beginning of the pandemic, MACJ worked with agency and nonprofit part with other agencies and nonprofit partners to stand up an entirely new set of services in under enrolled hotels in New York City. Beginning in late March of 2020, MACJ worked with the New York City Office of Emergency Service and nonprofit partners, Exodus Transitional Services, to provide transitional housing to clients living in jails. These hotels have been vital to maintaining safety during the pandemic. And we are incredibly proud of the work that we have done here. Currently, those hotels serve more than 750 people. Finally, the courts. While we are optimistic about the reducing the city's jail population, I want to be clear, and I should be clear, then there are still significant challenges to overcome. The courts are critical to a fully functioning system and are necessary to achieve the goals of improving public safety, reducing unnecessary enforcement and incarceration and promoting safety. Since the beginning of the summer of 2020, the city has been calling the courts to help and work with us together in addressing the backlog and prioritizing cases involving gun violence, as well as other form type of cases. Delays in the processing of criminal cases have resulted in a jail in my opinion, that is functioning as a prison with more people being held for longer periods of time. About 30% of the people detained, right now 32% of the people detained have been held for more than a year. That's almost 1,700 people. They have been, many of them have been there the entire pandemic. Fewer court appearances and pretrial hearings result in fewer dispositions of felony cases. The inability to resolve felony hearings sorry, felony cases, has pretrial people in Rikers awaiting resolution of the cases for much longer periods of time than any point in the last eight years of this administration. It's a system that in often in many cases, it looks like indefinite detention. The justice system requires the resolution of these cases, whether that be a plea disposition or a sentence after trial. We need the courts to function at full capacity so the justice system can run, run smoothly and we are able to reduce the populations in Rikers Island. From the start of the pandemic, the city has worked with the courts, the district attorneys, the defenders and other partners to facilitate the continued operations of the social functions of the criminal justice and bring cases to conclusions and we will continue to do so. As the courts begin to increase their capacity, we are continuing to work with all the stakeholders as well as the state to reduce the jail population even farther. Right now, as I said, at 5,400. Through successful partnerships with the New York State Department of Correction and Community Supervision and Governor Hoshu's office, we are transitioning incarcerated women in the Rose Singers facility on Rikers Island to the state-run Bedford cities, Bedford Hills and Taconic facilities. We anticipate continued cooperation with the state to help reduce the number of people in city jails. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you the strategies and interventions that we are employing to reduce the city's jails population, some, as well as some of the challenges that we are working hard to overcome. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Thank you. Uh, we will now turn it over to questions from Chair Powers. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, and thank you for the testimony from uh, the various agencies here. We have lots of questions. Um, I want to start maybe with where we just left off with Mock J just talking about population and census. So um, just give us the head count. Can you just let us know what the head count is today in our city jail? Yes, you can be, give me one second. My I have it right here is five four four four. Five thousand four hundred forty four. Okay, got yeah. it. Um, you know, as I understand it, there was a mayor's goal. The mayor had a goal of getting that population at below 5,000 uh, by the end of December. And certainly part of this plan not only is about reducing the census, but also, you know, uh, uh, it's a requirement here too. And we recognize the stresses on that. You noted the court system as one of them. Can you just give us, we've heard a lot about the court system, both in uh, the We've heard the mayor talk about a lot of when it comes to public safety in the city, but certainly we've also heard the uh, DOC talk about it when it comes to the census, the daily census inside our city jails and custody. Could you just give us more of a sense of what is happening right now in the court system, what, how functional they are, uh, how many cases you're seeing getting processed there relative to normal, what we call normal times, and and maybe just elaborate a little bit on what is happening in the court system that's causing the daily census inside of our city jails to be higher than expected. Yes, of course. I will tr try to do that the best of my ability. So I want to emphasize the main challenges that we see in the courts, but also try to figure out how we work, try to work together right now. In the court systems, we know that court appearances are down close to what you call normal times. So I'll use 2019 by almost 35%. Pre-trial hearings are down 55%. Pleas are down close to 50, 55%. A trials are down 90%. But what is important in many of these instances is also sentences are down about 55%. If one looks at, for instance, the number of pretrial detainees who are there for a violent felony, who are, by the way, 97% of those 1,700 who have been there for, 99% of those who have been there for more than one year, there are 3,934 pretrial violent felony detainees today. If those cases were moving faster, if those people were either sentenced to prison well, those people were sent back to the community because of the resolution of the case determined and they should have not been there in the first place. A, we will see those numbers to go down. When you have a court system, A, with all the challenges, then it's not operating at that level of functionality than we expect. Where you see is probably a gap in my estimation of at least 800, 900 cases at minimum. A, for these very older cases, say 24 or more, a, than are there. So I look, for instance, on 2019, I look at to, prior to the pandemic, we know we were there in between 800 to 900 retail uh, folks who have been there for more than a year. Now we see the 700. We know perfectly well. Then again, if the court were to resolve those cases, we will be in a different disposition. That also helped us in in the public safety component, because I think we have highlighted these in many situations. And I think Judge Lipman did that in very recently in an op-ed when he noted that when people are there and they don't know when their case is going to be resolved, that leads to more violence in the jails. That certainly leads to more people to be desperate. And in the long term, is going to impact our ability to reduce recidivism. Those are, that's a very particular way in which I think the courts and and the justice system right now is not helping in our jail population, but it's also impacting, again, the jail as well as our public safety. That's a very the best way I can describe, uh, in my view, how the data supports their claims, uh, the claims that the mayor has made about the need for the system to be fully operational, as you have indicated. 
at it. And I, we've also been joined, I think, believe by Councilmember Dharma Diaz as well. Hey, Councilmember. Um, can you what what's the what is the average stay today for an individual in custody? The average time in custody. Days I I'll get that number for you in two seconds, but I know it has to double. I'll I'll get that particular number in one second. Okay. I think the, the the right measure is what is the average time again than the largest group of population, which are the violent felony, pretrial violent felony offenders, are they are, and I'll get you right then, right away. Okay, get us that number. Maybe you can tell us how that compares to pre-COVID. Um, this is probably for you go see, uh, uh, but want to know just we're going to go back to the jail population numbers in a second. I just want to talk about facility closures and the transfer of Rikers Island uh, to get from. To, to DCAS. Can you tell us right now which DOC facilities are currently closed on both Rikers Island and in the boroughs? Yes, uh, uh, we have Manhattan House is closed, Brooklyn House is closed, um, and uh, JATC was the facility we transferred. You transferred that to DCAS, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and that was, as I understand it, the first facility transferred at DOC under the Renewable Rikers Act. Uh, do we have, do, can you give us a sense of when the city will transfer other closed facilities to ECAS and, and potentially explain to us why those haven't been, why other facilities haven't been transferred at this point? Yes, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Councilman Powers. We want to close Rikers Island uh, and we want to do so by 2027. But there are a couple of variables that we need to keep in mind as we move forward to transfer either land or facilities. One is around population. When we toured with you, we toured with other council members. We saw what happened when intake exploded and operationally, we didn't have the capacity to really manage though the number of, of people that were coming into the system. We have since cleaned that up and <laughs> we opened up EMTC, we opened up two clinics, we are processing people expeditiously, people are getting housed. We don't have the experience that you saw when you came out here. We don't want to get in that situation again. So it really depends on the population reduction that needs to happen. It, it depends on an assessment of what facility is the best facility to open up. Uh, I mean, to, to close, we need to make sure that we maintain maximum ops, uh, operational capacity. We don't want to close a facility where the cells don't work or we don't have the capacity to bring in people as the population uh, shifts. So it's a very fluid uh, process, but here's what I can tell you. We are absolutely committed to closing Rikers Island and opening up the borough-based jail system in 2027. And as the picture becomes clearer to us in terms of who's coming into our system, decarceration is happening, staff stabilization, assessment of our facility operations, we will be closing facilities and turning those facilities over. We are committed to doing that. Do you have population targets in terms of census targets in terms of headcount that you see as thresholds that you once you cross, you can close another facility today? How do you move from uh, what's, what I recognize as a sort of operational challenge that you're facing right now and the need for some flexibility and operations, but we also have this, this obvious goal here and the timeline we're putting ourselves on to do that. Uh, are there thresholds that you, that the DOC, the agency sees as being required to then move on to the next phase of moving and or closing facilities? I, we don't have a particular number because we don't want to get to that place where we say, if we get down to, you know, 5,000, we can close this facility. I think we all witnessed what happened when population went down, and then in a few short months, it went up to 6,000 people. We want to make sure that when we make a decision, we have maximum operational capacity to be able to respond to whatever fluctuations happen with community public safety. So there's not a hard number we're looking at. It is a very fluid situation, but I can tell you we are committed as the population comes down and it stabilizes, as our staffing stabilizes, to turn over the facilities that will give us the least operational flexibility so that we maintain the most operational flexibility with the facilities that we do remain on. But we are committed to closing and turning over facilities. 
Uh, how does the administration, one of the, one of the, the points that has come up during this, and I know that you're taking some steps to fix some of the uh, disrepair and the capital needs inside of the city facilities, uh, including fixing some of the doors that have been uh, easily manipulated. But I, I kind of, one question that's kind of constantly come up is how do we, how do we handle the capital needs and the state of disrepair in the facilities on Rikers Island with the long-term plan to close those facilities? Can you share with us plans that the agency is taking to address the current capital needs and state of disrepair and how the agency will view the long-term uh, closure of the plan against the sort of immediate needs to make sure that those facilities are humane and safe? Absolutely. So part of what our priorities right now is making sure that our members of service and our staff are safe. That includes priority number one is fixing the locking mechanisms on our doors. We are engaged in a very aggressive timeline to repair the doors that are broken to ensure those that are in our custody and in our care are able to maintain, maintain safety. So that's an investment we're doing. We're now looking at what other investments we need to make capital-wise to ensure that the decaying facilities don't provide the weapons we see uh, happening on, on now. So we are doing a facility-by-facility facility assessment about what needs to be repaired, what is prioritized, and we're going to fix those things that pose risk, safety risk, and pose challenges to our officers in managing the population we have. We're setting officer safety, incarcerated people's safety as a priority. So our capital projects are aligning to those two priorities. Simultaneously, we are moving forward with a, the borough-based jail system. What we know is that these facilities are old. They don't speak to the humanity of our officers. And they don't speak to the humanity of the people incarcerated. They are isolated and they are outdated and they are beyond their usefulness. And we need to build a system, one that is a smaller footprint, one that could be managed much more easily through technology and safety innovations and really provide services to those who are incarcerated. So our capital projects are prioritized based on the safety of our officers and those who are in our care. Some of the, um, thank you, thank you for that. Some of the facility closures uh, we believe, and I think you might agree, will result in significant savings and headcount reductions. And that's one of the central components of the borough-based jails plan. In light of the current staffing issues that the agency is facing, the department anticipate that it can continue generating savings from facility closures. And if so, is there any numbers or data you could tell, share with us about savings when it comes to additional facility closures? Yeah, the, 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 the savings and built out in the modeling of the borough-based jail system. We're going to have a smaller borough-based jail system closer to courts, reduction in court transportations, uh, and a smaller just footprint overall. Right now we have 11,000 beds. We're going down to 3,300 beds. In that, over time, there are significant savings. With respect to our staff, and we, we uh, are not handling, handling any layoffs or anything like that. We're not projecting any layoffs. Our staffing will be as, uh, assessed as we get to the borough-based jail. We lose between five and 700 uh, members of service each year. So we think through attrition, uh, we'll get a balance that allows us to have safe jails, have adequate staffing, and keep people in custody safely. Are, are there specific savings that you, you might be able to share with the council, uh, anticipated savings as you move into additional facilities and into the borough-based jails? Does the DOC or MACJ have any data they can share with us about anticipated or updated savings from facility closures? I, I would, I would uh, turn to uh, Marcos or DDC if they have specific numbers. If not, that's something we can get back to you. Marco, do you want to jump I, in? There? I don't have the specific calculations. I, I just want to uh, address when you have time also the number that has the information you have asked me. Yep. I, I don't have the specific calculations. I will definitely work with DOC and send it to you. With regards to the time in custody, there are two ways in which we measure the time in custody. We look at the medium time in custody, the, uh, 
and that went up from 103 days to 180, 75 percent up increase. A, if you look at the average, uh, the pure average, that went up from 190 days to 320 days or 68 percent. Those are the increases that we have seen in the population and the time that people are in custody. Uh, with regards to the other calculation, I'll work with my colleagues at DOC and we'll provide you those calculations. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Um, just moving on, and uh, we'll look out for that that data as follow up to the hearing. Um, the one of the uh, uh, obviously current facilities is the Barge, the Vernon Bain uh, Correctional Center in the Bronx. Does the DOC have plans to address the barge as part of this plan, whether it's closure or or any changes? And if so, can you share what those plans are? Yes, as part of the borough based uh, jail system, BCBC barge will be closed. The borough based jail system will have uh, borough based jails located in each borough. And so, yes, BCBC is in the closure plan. When we talk about closing Rikers, we talk about closing any borough based jail facilities, any facilities that uh, uh, the department currently operates. And so, BCBC is in that plan. Okay, and is there a timing of that? A timing of when we close BCBC, we don't have. As I said uh, earlier, as we the population reduces and stabilizes, we'll be making an assessment about what facility is best to close and what facility remain open that gives us the maximum ability to operate. But we will be considering every facility as the population decreases, which one we need to close. Okay. Um, I want to move to a point of agreement that was part of the closure plan. As uh, part of the, clo the closure plan of Rikers and the borough-based jails plan, the council and administration neg negotiated a point of agreement plan in October that committed, it, 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 when, when we passed the plan, that, it, um, that commits a total of $390, $391 million in programs and facilities. That includes 254 million in citywide investments and 137 million in district level investments in and around the facilities where the neighborhoods, the, new, the, the neighborhoods where the new facilities are slated to be built or rebuilt. Can you take, give us an update on that? Have all the funding commitments in the point of agreement been met? And if not, can you tell us what is in place to meet those commitments before the end of the administration on December 31st? So I can take that question. A, in May of 2021, we provided a public update on where we were on the point on the points of agreement. That's a requirement, and then we have annually. We will be providing a new update in January. Right now, we are working. We are, as you know, in the middle of the November plan, and we are working with OMB to determine the exact the final amount of funding for the POA initiatives in the FY22 budget and FY23 budget. I cannot disclose right now, obviously, when there are deliberative conversations of the administration in that matter, but we will have a release soon of that information and we will be updated again uh, when we do an update of our points of agreement public plan in January of 2022. Uh, the, uh, just to follow up on that for a second, so the Beyond Rikers website shows the status of commitment but I don't believe it's been updated since May of this year, about six months ago. When will the tracker be updated to show progress on those commitments over yes. the last six months? And will that be, as you come to an agreement or talk about the November plan, will we see that reflected on the website as well? So I apologize if I wasn't clear about that. A, we have a, the points of agreement have to be updated annually. That's why you have the May. As I said, we will be updating the points of agreement either in January 2002 or sooner, but we plan definitely to update as soon as we have the additional information of what would be in the November plan as, as we collect additional information that we do, we do. But we are actually working already on the updating. We just need to finalize these deliberations with OMB. But our obligation and there is to, for an annual update, I just want to make clear, we are not late or anything, it's just we comply with that in May, and we will comply again in 2022. Okay, we appreciate sooner. that. And, and sooner is, is helpful, especially as writing the end of this administration to have 
an updated snapshot of where full, we are. I fully argue. agree, Chair Powers. I, I, you know, exactly as you said, we will, who knows what's going to happen on January 1st. So I am, I have a commitment to update the tracker as soon as possible. Okay. I want to just talk about the justice involved supporting housing units that are part of that. Will there be an amended RFP to be issued for those units? And what is being done right now to get those 380 units online? Uh, America, I think you probably can uh, give HR Powers an update on that particular issue since you have the details, if you don't mind. Uh, the JISH is um, under the Department of Health, so I would prefer not to answer on their behalf. Are you, well, let's, let's ask a more specific question that, you know, I think somebody here could speak to it. Does anyone have knowledge of an amended RFP being issued for those units? Okay, so that sounds like a no, no. Uh, unless you want to share with us an update. But we will follow up with it. Okay. Um, as we're going, I'm going to talk about design of these facilities. Um, it, I, as as Mock J, and I think we have representatives from DDC here as well, are going through that process. Obviously, a lot of it is about operations and ways to, and I think you, so I think the test, some of the testimony spoke to ways to change the operations of uh, the DOC and, and to limit transport, to limit in, uh, facility transportation and provide services uh, more uh, close to where folks are being housed in their units. Um, obviously, Board of Corrections plays such an important role in uh, sort of oversight and operations. How is Mark Jane DDC involving the Board of Corrections in the design process and in the conversations around the new facilities? So, a, as you know from the and I mentioned that in the testimony, IMACJ has been involved uh, from the beginning of the administration in, in the redesigning of the jails even before there was a closed rifle plan. We are in charge of the Justice Implementation Task Force. We have convened multiple meetings with all the stakeholders and we continue uh, and specifically we have a person assigned to that project in my office. Her name is here, Executive Director Mali who might specifically address how all the questions about design are implemented and how she works collaboratively with other people to address those issues. Nadine, do you mind to please address the question? Yes. Great. You're right. Uh, yeah. So uh, we work very closely with the Department of Correction and all, all of our stakeholders, uh, justice advocates, a design implementation tax force, uh, neighborhood action committees, uh, in order to take all of those comments um, into consideration as we develop the ongoing program with um, the Department of Design and Construction uh, for the development of uh, the projects. Um, it has been a an iterative process um, as we are excited to be receiving the SOQs uh, in one week, um, which are the design build um, responses to the RFQ that went out um, and the hopes for the RFP for the Manhattan facility by the end of this administration. So all the work will get um, folded into that RFP. Um, perhaps I could ask Rebecca Cloth from DDC to talk further about the design component, um, if you'd like. Um, I can, excuse me, Chair Powers, I can cut in specifically about the Board of Correction. Um, all of the designs will obviously comply with the minimum standards that the board has, but more importantly, we have been convening quarterly meetings with the board to both provide them regular updates about the plans for the rural base jails and also seek their feedback. So we are in very close consultation with them our next quarterly meeting, I believe, is scheduled for December 15th. Um, and so, again, yeah, we are working quite closely with them. Okay, we just urge that they're part of the process. Obviously, the minimum standards are such a big part of, uh, especially when you talk about some of the units we're talking about in these and the services provided. So, um, just to move on, um, I want to talk about the women's facility. Uh, you know, currently, uh, women are supposed to be housed in the, in the Queens facility. Uh, administration agreed to explore the feasibility of moving the women's facility to a different site. Can you give us an update on that? Is, has, is the administration still exploring that and have any conclusions been reached? 
Well, we, as, as, as we put out in the plan, we have built separate space for the women in the Queens uh, plan. Uh, we continue with that, that plan uh, moving forward. We have consulted with women advocates group. We've heard them uh, with the advocates to make sure that women have uh, their space uh, that is built out for them. Uh, and we have done that in our Queens plan. And that continues. I'm sorry, could you say it one more time? I couldn't hear. Just the, the yeah. back up. We, we have built out uh, space for the women in our borough-based jail system in the Queens facility. Originally, we were thinking about building out space in each of the facilities. We've heard from the advocates in the community that they would like the women to have unique space for them, and we have built that out and planned for that in the Queens facility. Okay, but I just want to, I think my question was something different than that. My question was, I believe there's an agreement to explore feasibility of potentially an independent site or moving to a different site. And I was I'm asking just an update on that process. I, I recognize that the current commitment, current plan uh, has Queens as where women will be housed. I'm, I, I guess my question was, has there been any exploration of changing that? I think as the administration said they might do. and is the final decision here to stay remain in Queens or is there still an openness or an exploration to do something different? We, we're open to uh, any discussions with council and leadership. Uh, that is a very interesting uh, uh, idea at this particular moment as the women's population uh, continues to uh, decrease. We are absolutely open to continuing conversations but for planning purposes for the borough-based jail system, we have included the women in the Queens facility. But we're very much willing to continue to have that kind of conversation about what other possibilities could exist. Um, but we are doing the kind of planning we need to ensure that the women have their space in the Queens facility. Okay, thank you. And I wanna know we've also been joined here by Council Member Rosenthal, and I'd urge the administration to keep exploring and the city agency to keep looking at uh, space. I think I recognize some of the challenges here, but I think it is something we've heard from a lot of it in a lot of individuals and organizations that they would like to see as a as a goal as we move forward here in the plan as well. Um, just moving on some more. Um, is, is there any effort here to expedite procurement for projects? Obviously, as the administration who has been part of this process is outgoing, um, uh, it, it, has there been any efforts to try to move procurement forward to uh, make additional progress on the plan? I'll hand that over to DDC, Rebecca. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is Rebecca Clough. Um, we have done a number of things to help expedite procurements. We have uh, work with all of our partners, OMB, the Mayor's List of Contracts, uh, as well as our sponsor agencies to reduce the amount of time necessary for review and processing of materials. We have asked uh, the teams that are participating, they're getting their information into Passport before they even uh, submit their their qualifications or their proposal. So we're, we're not standing still, we're, we're working on a lot of different things at the same time to move it forward. Okay, and is the, um, is the, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get that. Is the city on track to register all contracts for the early work, work projects by the end of 2021? Yes, we are. All four contracts are at the uh, comptroller now, as a matter of fact. Okay, and which contracts are those? Just, just the, to be. Those are the dismantle and swing space for Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, and Brooklyn. Okay, and. Um, and we've when, already when, registered the trunk water main. Excuse me. Okay, and when does um, when does the city anticipate construction on new facilities will begin? Infrastructure on the new facilities. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. I said, when does the city anticipate construction on the new facilities to begin? 
The new facilities uh, we're expecting in our uh, request for qualifications to be submitted next week. Um, we would expect work to begin on the uh, facilities in, depending on which facility in 2023, um, all four quarters, there'll be a staggered approach, but all in 2023. Beginning in 2023? Correct. But the, the dismantle projects, you'll see work on site starting um, January, February of next year. Okay. Um, we have a lot of folks signed up, so I want to get to the board and then I also put I guess the last one, one, you know, big last question here is the the facilities anticipate, you know, a, a population of 3,300 by 2027 when the new facilities open. Can you share with us what is being done to meet that goal and also what additional steps the city or state may need to take in order to meet that population goal by 2027? I'll, I'll turn it over to Marcos. I am actually, my, Nadine from my team is much more qualified. She is my architect in the office and is, I can uh, address this particular specific question from you. Nadine, go ahead, please. Uh, just so I understand, um, Chair Powers, I think the question was on population reduction. No, sorry. Oh, yeah. So. I misunderstood the question that myself. Sorry, apologies. I, I was, I thought you were talking about the schedule. Uh, apologies, I misunderstood the question. Can you repeat apologies because I- The question was, what is being done to meet the goal of getting the jail population okay. under 3,300 by 2027, which is a premise or requirement? Ab apologies, I, I thought you were talking about uh, something else. So a, as I indicated in my testimony, there are three, four things that we have to do to address the GL population right now and the reduction to get to the 3,300. A, number one is we know that at least currently we have about 1,100, about 1,100 more people in jail today because of the violent felonies. And in order to do that, as I said, we plan to continue to work hard with the courts, the defenders, the DAs, the others to activate and return the courts to the full activity levels and we saw in 2019. A, we don't anticipate obviously the pandemic. Uh, I'm not a forecaster, but I, I expect that the pandemic will now be as persistent and by two, prior to 2026, we will not have the continuing effect on the court. The second is, as I said, by launching the RFP on supervised release, we are making sure that a, we have enough people a, in this alternative to detention is the strategy. Right now, we have more people in supervised release. The active workload in, of supervised release is higher than the number of people who are in jail. That is a tremendous, has a tremendous impact in the system. And what we are doing is by issuing an RFP, establishing by the fact that it's also part of a mandate under a and the new bill, bill reform we will continue to expand our services under supervised release and we will continue to reduce the number of admissions the third strategy as i mentioned is to reduce the number of people who are in because of city sentences and in order to do that we will continue to work on expanding and our work that i have described on alternatives to incarceration and diversion. Those are the programs and expansion um, that we are always looking to expand. We will continue to invest and create our strategies and work to give you a sense. In 2019, we have almost 900 people who were city sentenced. A, by the beginning of the pandemic, we were about 500. Right now, city sentences are down to 140 in DOC custody and a about a hundred and change uh, in the state. So that, um, that population is possible to reduce it significantly. And finally, I think an element that I have mentioned, I think is extraordinarily important, is to continue to push hard in re-entry strategies that reduce recidivism and make the city safer. At the end of the day, a, that is absolutely crucial, particularly in, in the areas that we think 
uh, can have a greater impact, which is the reoffending among violent offenders. Those are the four strategies. Uh, again, we are 5,400 5, today. We are not as far from the 3,300 goal by 2026 as we were at the beginning of this administration when we were at 1,100. It's a very different place. I, I appreciate that that update. And what is the what is the maximum capacity of the new bar based facilities? I not incorrect me, but it's, I correct me, but it's 3,800. Uh, I can mark up. I can speak to this. Yeah, um, go ahead. The, yeah, the total bed count across the four facilities is 3,544. So we have 3,544 beds total. Can I just clarify the number? Because 3,544? Yeah, there are 886 beds per facility, um, which gets you to 3,544. Okay. Um, just want to switch. Thank you. So I just want to switch to a question related to healthcare and provision of healthcare inside of our city jails. This is for CHS. Um, some of the new formatting of the units seems to be able to provide different opportunities to provide programming and care inside of them. But I want to this for CHS. Can you share with us any information on how the new the new facilities and formatting of units might change the opportunity to provide health care or what do I mean for individuals who are uh, going to sick hall or have to go see a doctor or looking for access to health care? I think we need to get uh, Jeanette uh, unmuted. Thank sure, you. great, thank you. Yes, this is Jeanette Merrill uh, with Clin uh, Correctional Health Services. Uh, so in the new units, uh, there will be more of a clinical presence um, and specific to your question, it will allow for greater access uh, to healthcare services uh, by CHS. Uh, not only will there be a dedicated intake space at each facility, uh, but there will be an infirmary and a clinic um, in each uh, facility. Uh, there also, as was mentioned in prior testimony, uh, about 50% of the units will be therapeutic housing units, uh, which is a model that we implement uh, in the jails now at a smaller percentage. Um, and that really allows for a dedicated clinical presence uh, embedded right into the health, uh, into the housing unit, um, including clinicians, social workers, psychiatric providers um, at a much higher ratio of CHS um, and DOC staff uh, right in the housing unit. Uh, so we do anticipate much better access uh, to care with the new design. And what, how many, how many, I, I saw in the testimony the 50% number, what is the percentage in the current facilities of therapeutic beds and units? Uh, it's about 13 to 14% of the housing units are therapeutic. So we're looking at a substantial increase. And does that require additional staffing or changes in staffing when we talk about increasing that number so large? Uh, I think staffing for correctional health services is something we'll keep a, uh, an eye on. Uh, we do know that even with the decrease in uh, the jail population, the needs of our patients will remain high. There will always be um, you know, serious health conditions and an acute clinical need. Um, I think you know, DOC can speak to their specific staffing needs. Okay. But do you, I think the answer might be yes. Do you feel like you are equipped to that? I think the 50% units is a positive, so I'm not. I'm not trying that. I just, you know, we're looking at budget impact, staffing needs. Does, do, do, will, should we anticipate that CHS will need to add staff or resources in order to meet that that increase? I think potentially, you know, I think right now we anticipate at least maintaining uh, current staff levels, certainly. Um, and then depending on, um, you know, how it looks moving forward, that's something that we'll consider in our plans. Okay, thank you. Um, just in respect of everybody's time who's waiting here, and uh, also we have the Board of Corrections, I believe, as well, uh, we'll move on to public testimony. I, I appreciate um, everyone update here. I think it's really important at the end of this administration on a plan that I, when I became the chair of the criminal justice committee, I walked in, I think just a few months in, we announced a plan to move forward this to get a update. We will have uh, certainly some follow-up information we will request to get a clearer picture of where we are. And also would certainly ask that you update any point of agreement information and uh, provide us any follow-up information so that any 
changes in administration, we have a clear picture of uh, status and commitments and funding and needs. And uh, that, I think that's a, a cr critical to us. Um, but I also think it's important we hear from many folks here in the public who are here to testify about uh, needs as well. So I want to make sure we get them an opportunity to speak as well. So thank you to everyone for uh, your testimony and taking questions. We will certainly look out for more information. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to the committee council to call on to the next council. Next panel. Yes, I just want to check that any um, council members had any questions. Oh, sure. I don't see any hands raised, but if you'd like to, if you're a council member, you'd like to ask a question now, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function. All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll move on um, to the Board of Correction. Um, Executive Director Meg Egan, you may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm Margaret Egan, Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction. Thank you for inviting me to share my testimony on the city's borough-based jail program. The Board of Correction is an independent oversight and regulatory agency charged with ensuring that the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services meet the board's minimum standards, which cover care, custody, correction, treatment, supervision, and discipline of people in custody in the city's jails. The charter also gives the board an advisory role over capital planning and improvements, which is closely connected to the board's need to ensure the minimum standards are fully incorporated into design, into the design, construction, and operation of any new jails, including the borough-based jail facilities. Based on the board's insight into the city jails and my own experience as a senior advisor to the Independent Commission on criminal, New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, also known as the Littman Commission, I want to thank, I want to share some thoughts with on the borough-based jail plan with you today. Both Mayor de Blasio and the City Council have committed to closing Rikers Island and building smaller, safer, fairer, and more humane jail system in the boroughs, broadly carrying out the recommendations of the Littman Commission. This plan has taken on new significance given the current state of the jails. As I testified before you earlier this fall, the city's jails remain in crisis. Due to persisting staffing shortages, the department continues to struggle to provide basic services and supplies to people in custody. We are particularly concerned about the department and CHS's ability to provide consistent access to medical and mental health care. The department is also struggling to manage ongoing violence in the facilities, fostering a dangerous environment for people in custody and those staff who are working. While staffing and management is key to the current crisis, the existing jails are not designed to meet the goals that we all share and are in a state of disrepair. The design of the current buildings creates dangerous sight lines for staff and does not provide space for effective programming care or positive interaction and people are able to fa fashion dangerous weapons from the deteriorating buildings. As the board has said repeatedly, decarceration is a short-term imperative to addressing the current crises of staffing shortages, extending extended stays in inhumane conditions, and lack of access to mandated services, including basic health and mental health care. But it is also essential in the long term to close Rikers Island and transition to a borough-based system. The city's plan sets a goal of 3,300 people in custody by 2027. A recent report from the Littman Commission and the Center for Court Innovation outlines a series of reforms that can reduce the jail population to 2,700 to 3,150. As of November 19th, 2021, the jail population was at approximately 5,320 after reaching a 40 year, 40 year low, low of approximately 3,800 in April, 2020. The initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated that the population can be dramatically reduced when the criminal justice system stakeholders come together. As the commission and CCI outline, we can continue to dramatically reduce the jail population again by addressing the COVID-19 backlog of cases, reducing the use of jail and expanding the use of alternatives for a number of different groups and addressing case processing delays. We have done it before and we can do it again. The board strongly endorses these recommendations and will continue to advocate for decarceration. The design of the new facilities will be a critical component of the plan's overall success. 
grounded in dignity, care, safety, and work to prevent isolation from society and family and located in the boroughs, there will be improved services and connections to attorneys, families, and visitors. The program requires dedicated space for programming, education, healthcare, and visiting to more effectively support reentry to communities. The new programs will include a focus on rehabilitation, including skills and job training, education, cooking, and workshops, and provide for the medical and mental health needs of those in custody. Spaces will enable people to work together, promoting a, a sense of common purpose and shared responsibility rather than animosity. Critically, the design also prior, prioritizes visitors, ensuring accessibility and comfort for the families and friends visiting their loved ones. These are important design principles and the city has taken significant action to Im implement this plan and yet more remains to be done. Given the board's essential role as the regulatory and oversight authority over the jail system, the minimum standards must play a critical role in setting the standards for basic conditions of confinement, medical care, mental health care, eliminating sexual abuse and restrictive housing in the borough-based jail system. At the same time, the plan to close Rikers Island creates a critical opportunity for the board to assess, assess its cr current minimum standards to identify opportunities to update, update them to ensure that the baseline conditions of confinement meet, meet the goals of the new jail, jails and current best practices. The board standards set a floor for the department and CHS, and this plan provides an opportunity to raise that floor. Each of the new jail RFPs account for the minimum board's minimum standards and include them as an addendum. However, to date, the board has not been involved in the development of the RFPs. The department has begun providing the board with regular briefings on the plan, which we greatly appreciate, but there is no indication that the board will be involved in the design process. The board must be at the table going forward. One key example of the board's need to be involved to ensure minimum standards are met is the city's plan to establish outposted therapeutic housing units within or adjacent to existing health and hospital acute care facilities. These units would be secured clinical units operated by CHS and DOC, allowing, the, allowing people in custody to receive specialty care within hospitals and allow for continuity of care. The board applauds this initiative, but we note that the board's minimum standards include requirement for the provision of medical and mental health care, but CHS and DOC have not yet detailed how they intend to meet minimum standards, other minimum standards for those held in the new therapeutic housing units. For example, CHS has not disclosed, disclosed what conditions would be treated in the, in the facilities, nor the criteria for determining whether someone should be admitted or discharged. Additionally, we have not seen details on how people housed in these units will have access to basic rights afforded by the minimum standards, including recreation, visit, visiting, and law library. Moreover, CHS has yet to detail how people hospitalized under correctional control will be prepared to reenter their communities beyond medical care. As this example demonstrates, the board must be at the table throughout the design process to ensure that the minimum standards are met. Finally, equally important to the success of the borough-based jail plan is, re is reforming the organizational culture of the Department of Correction. Simply moving into new buildings will not cure the problems that we see today in the New York City jail system. In order to truly meet the goals of a smaller, safer, fairer, more humane jail system for people in custody, families, and staff, the culture of the institution must change. There are several crucial pieces to effective organizational culture change, accountability and management and performance, re-envisioning policies and procedures, recruiting and hiring for culture change, using training and education as tools for culture change, and ensuring the well-being and support of staff. In order to achieve all of these, the city and the department will need to make significant, also make significant investments in people and systems. The culture change will be long and hard, but it is imperative for the success of all who live and work in our city's jails. The Board of Correction fully supports the city's plan to close Rikers Island and build a new, uh, build new state-of-the-art facilities in the boroughs. It is imperative that these new facilities are built to reflect the goals of a smaller, safer, fairer, more humane jail system. The board is encouraged by progress to reduce the jail population from nearly 11,000 in 2017 to 6,000 in 2021, and encourages all stakeholders to recommit to further reducing the jail population. The design of the new facilities is also critical to ensure 
the spaces and operations support the city's goals. To that end, the board's involvement will be essential in the design of the new facilities and for the city to account for the minimum standards across the full plan, including CHS's plan to build outpatient units. The city must also commit to meaningful culture change in the Department of Correction. Failure to do so will mean that we simply move troubling conditions on the island into the boroughs. Finally, the board recognizes the opportunity that the plan to close Rikers Island presents an opportunity to review and update its own regulations to support the goals of the new jails and best practice most effectively. The board will continue to monitor the city's work to make this plan a reality. Thank you for inviting me to speak today and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, thank you for that uh, excellent testimony and I do have a number of questions on it. Uh, but I will note it is your last hearing here as uh, uh, Executive Director of the Board of Corrections with the City Council. So I want to give you a very big uh, uh, thank you for all the work that you've done at the Board of Corrections and undoubtedly a partner to us and to the, the broad city when it comes to making sure that our correctional system is humane and safe and fair and has appropriate oversight. So uh, I do have questions but I wanna make sure I said thank you up front for your work here at the board. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to work with you and your staff and the committee. Thank you and, and, and same. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, so the first is just to go through some of the testimony, you mentioned the board standards set a floor that department and CHS before the uh, department and CHS and that this plan the borough-based borough -based jails plan provides an opportunity to raise that floor. And I think you go through some of it, but can you just give us a sense of where you see areas where the plan might call, you know, offer an opportunity to raise the floor on the minimum standards? Sure, I think I think it's really around the first three chapters. So the, the chapter one standards that sort of govern general conditions of confinement um, chapter and then the the chapters around medical and mental health care. The, those, I mean, one of the wonderful things is that that the board has been has been in existence for a long time, and and those were some of the original standards that were developed. And so they just need an update. They need an update to to um, to reflect best practice um, and and reflect the needs of of both people in custody and staff in these new buildings. So those would be the places that, that I would really focus on. Okay, appreciate that. And you had made a note that the board's um, minimum standards include requirements for provision of medical and mental health care, but CHS and DOC have not detailed yet how they tend to meet those standards for people held in the new therapeutic housing units. When, in your opinion, should that be happening when they're providing uh, information to the board about how they intend to meet the minimum standards? Is that now during design? Is that right before they open? When is the best, most ideal? And also certainly when's the last moment where you think that has to happen? I think definitely in the design phase. Um, we want to make sure, I, I, I think the, there is there is, you know, certainly accounting for the design of the physical space, but but how these spaces will actually function and, and be operated. And I think that's a perfect, you know, figuring out how people are gonna be afforded recreation, figuring out how people are gonna, going to be afforded visiting in those spaces um, certainly matters for the physical design, but also the operational design. So I, I think, you know, ideally, in the design phase and almost it's almost you know too late they're gonna you know I, I worry that the department and chs will have to to go back to the drawing board if it's not if those issues aren't considered in the design phase okay i understand i got it um and then the um the other area i want to ask the uh, you sort of been touching on this but the board recognized the opportunity to plan to close Rikers Island prevents to update its own regulations to support the goals of the new jails and best practice more effectively. I think you mentioned those are the three chapters, but still, when, when do you believe that should happen? Is that now, is that later? What, when's the best ideal moment for the board to review and update its own regulations to support the goals of the new jails and best practices more effectively? 
I think it's on a parallel track along with the design piece. Um, I think the board needs to be, as I said, I think the board needs to be at the table as these buildings are actually designed. Same reason, right? We, you want to account for, for the physical design and the operational design. And I think working closely with DOC, CHS, DDC on the design will also highlight the areas that the board should focus on and, and go into rulemaking across those areas. So I think it's on a parallel track. Okay, I got it. Um, great, well, thank you for the testimony. Very helpful and, uh, and good to see areas where the city and the board and the departments together can do more to update the minimum standards and also ensure the plan's overall success. So we really appreciate the board's uh, role in all this. And I do encourage the agency and the administrations to play a larger, well, have a larger dialogue with the board. I, I agree that you guys play an important role here in the, and should be happening while the design is happening. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to go back and update your own minimum standards and regulations. So. Thank you for, for that. And of course, thanks once, once again, and good luck. I don't know Thank what's you. next, but good luck to you. And we always appreciate the board and your role here in helping us do our jobs more effectively. So thanks again and uh, enjoy the holidays. Thank you, I appreciate it. You too. Thanks. Um, I just wanna check again, if any council members have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Okay, um, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and will also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would like to now welcome Zachary Katz Nelson to testify followed by Brandon Holmes followed by Darren Mack. Your time will begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Again, I'm Zachary Ketznelson. I'm the executive director of the Littman Commission. Really appreciate you holding this hearing today. So getting off records, clearly it's an emergency. And getting the population down is the most urgent thing that we can do right now, in addition to getting shovels in the ground. So you know, out we laid out a plan, as has been mentioned, with CCI earlier this year. It really shows that we can get the population down safely, securely, it can be done deliberately. You know, we have six years to get this right, but we obviously want to get people off as quickly as absolutely possible. As you're looking at the jails, I just want to mention a few things the city can do to really bring down both the size of the jails and get better outcomes for everybody. The first is supportive housing. We need to get as many supportive housing beds online as absolutely possible. The mayor elects plan to have convert hotels to supportive housing is an excellent one that should be pushed forward as quickly as possible. Second, maximize the number of secure hospital beds that we have available. The mayor currently has pledged almost 400 beds, but there are almost 1,000 people at Rikers with serious mental illness, more with serious other health needs. We need more secure hospital beds that allow us to shrink the size of the borough-based jails and get people the care they need. And then those, those three empty or underutilized state prisons in Manhattan, one could be used for women that can shrink the Queens jail by 15%. And the other two could be used for therapeutic housing for people with serious mental illness that can bring the entire borough jail size down by 10%. Really good positive investments and much better outcomes for everybody, both individuals and long-term in terms of recidivism. And finally, we should be investing in those ATI programs that were mentioned, things like the Women's Community Justice Project and Exodus, which particularly involve housing alongside wraparound services, far better outcomes, lower recidivism, better for our city as a whole. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, your ongoing work uh, to close Rikers Island, but of course the recommendations and the, the most recent recommendations, but also your testimony as well. Nice to see you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Brandon Holmes, followed by Darren Mack, followed by Jane Elke. Thank your you. time will begin. Thank you. Um, I first want to acknowledge uh, Meg Egan of the Board of Corrections. Thank you, and I admire the work that you've done in leading BOC staff to really try to have an oversight role that can 
support and be complementary to the work that Chair Powers and the council have done to hold DOC accountable um, and protect lives in custody. Uh, you know, on September 15th, we testified before this committee on the increasingly horrific conditions on Rikers, and a lot of that has been raised today and kind of discussed today. Um, and we recognize that many of these things still, these issues still persist. And in my testimony from September 15th, I cited that we had 10 deaths in New York City jails this year. And now we've seen that increase by 40%. So the crisis is growing, and I hope that this hearing um, and the purpose of these hearings is still to build the case for council members doing their jobs as a delegation that can really advance this city um, in many ways. These hearings have to result in action, and we know that you all have access to the data, the testimony, and our protests to provide the opportunity to do your jobs as effectively as possible. But we still have to reckon with the 14 lives that were lost and the fact that you know this hearing must turn into action in the upcoming stated meetings. Um, such as passing intro 2173, knowing that several of the deceased New Yorkers were subject to torture by solitary, and many more continue to face this day in and day out on Rikers Island. We believe that the city has run out of time for debate, and we really need to put the pedal to the floor. So we need to talk right now about these four immediate actions that I'm including, and I'm sure many others will add more. But council must require MockJ and future administrations to assess and report on every defendant's ability to pay because MockJ did not acknowledge that their district attorneys and judges that their mayor has appointed are still sending people to death on Rikers Island, setting bail amounts that they cannot pay. Time has expired. We also need the council to immediately pass Drum's legislation to end solitary. I know that you're familiar with that, but we know that de Blasio just did an executive order, which ironically defies his own order and plans with DOC to pass off RMAS as a new alternative to solitary. So we need the council to pass this legislation. And my last two points for returning members, undertake serious efforts to address the culture of violence and impunity within DOC. This past year and the year before during peak COVID, you failed to reduce the budget and scope of DOC's work, right? And now they are actively, the union is actively disrupting services in the city jails, resulting in lives lost. So we need to rein that in. And we need a collaboration that really moves DOC and the mayor's office forward on identifying a standalone site for women. Because ultimately what has happened is while the city council and mayor's office could not find an alternative for less than 300 folks on the island, all of those folks are now vulnerable to being transferred further from their families, further from the courts and services that they need. And it just completely spits in the face of all the work that you all and us have put in to close Rikers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those specific recommendations and your ongoing work. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Darren Mack, followed by Jane Elke, followed by Angel Tueros. Good afternoon, Chair Member Powers and committee members. My name is Darren Mack. I'm a co-director at Freedom Agenda, and I'm also a survivor of Rikers Island. I believe, as most New Yorkers believe in justice, in the words of the philosopher and author Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote that the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. And similarly, I say that the degree of civilization in a city can be judged by entering its jails. And it would be fair to say that we are living in a state of barbarism. We all know about the conditions at Rikers Island. However, we can't lose sight of conditions in the current existing jails in the boroughs and the boat as well. I also experienced incarceration at the Brooklyn House Detention Complex and it's deteriorating, antiquated, and does not meet state minimum standards like the other facilities in the boroughs currently. Every summer we held demonstrations in front of Brooklyn House because people were suffering from the heat and lack of ventilation, no air conditioning, and every winter, the same thing. We demonstrated because people were suffering from the cold, lack of heat, and, and no adequate heating system. And a wrecking ball to the Brooklyn House cannot come soon enough. New York, New York City Department of Corrections budget is the highest DOC budget in the country. We spend the most money on DOC and get the worst results. LA Department of Correction has three times as many people detained with half the budget of New York City DOC. So to truly end mass incarceration, we need to make mass investments 
in communities that have been historically under-resourced and divest from DOC. In 2009, along with the historic vote to move forward with the borough-based plan to close all 10 jails and records out in the boat, the city council approved a wide range of investments totaling $391 million to address the roots of incarceration. So city council must fulfill those points of agreement. And for those city council members returning in 2022, local law 193, which established the commission on reinvestment communities impacted by Rackets Island. The commission will be submitting- Time has expired. Next month, it is informed by people who work and serve impacted communities. And I encourage you to support the work of the commission, provide baseline funding in the city budget for the commission to, to continue its work through 2027 and follow those through on those recommendations. Lastly, I urge you to move forward with the borough-based plan if we want to rid ourselves of a barbaric system and the campaign to close Rikers recently released recommendations on how to advance and strengthen the plan to close Rikers, which we hope you review, support, and implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony and nice to see you. Thanks, wow. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jane Elke, followed by Angel Tueros, followed by Crystal Gooding. The time will begin. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Jane Elke. My husband and I live a few blocks from the Brooklyn House of Detention. I want to speak today from my perspective as a community resident, as well as a personal friend from someone who's been held at Rikers pre-trial since early January of this year. The plan our city has committed to must be expedited. Every day the current system continues. People from our communities are suffering, including those who work in the jails. I know that um, the employees are just as um, an unsafe and decrepit a situation as are the people incarcerated. Most of the people I talk with in my community have no idea of what our jails are like or what it costs to hold people. How there is little focus on ways of keeping people from becoming involved in the system to begin with, or what could help to turn around those who have become involved. How people with serious mental illness and addictions are housed in with the general population. How little attention is given to preparation for reentry. The public needs education and needs to know ways that they, they and we often support the better approach in your plan. Some homeowners voice concern for their property values. I can testify from eight years of living near the Brooklyn Borough Jail that our property values have continued to rise and our neighborhood has not been impacted. The hope is for a whole new justice center there, one that serves a new justice system as well, including separate accommodations for people suffering with mental illness and addictions in a building that will also lend itself to new community uses as the number of people incarcerated declines. You are the council that approved the historic plan for New York City. Please do all that you can in the remainder of this year to move that plan forward and to ensure that the new city council supports the obligations of that plan. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much for the testimony. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Angel Tueros, followed by Crystal Gooding, followed by Roger Clark. Um, time will begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice Committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Angel Tueros. I'm a public health advisor, a human rights and social justice activist, and a member of Freedom Agenda. As long as Rikers Island remains open, the era of class and racial mass incarceration will be far from over. We have seen the conditions of confinement there um, worsen and throughout New York City's jail system, uh, the conditions have turned from bad to worse. 25 years ago, I was first caged in Queens House Jail a dark, narrow, and filthy place, and later transferred to Rikers Island. I witnessed that uh, violence rule, the physical design of dormitories and cells, cages, nurture stress, and violence among those who were there and those who were detained. We were treated like animals and expected to behave, behave like humans. Except 
except perhaps for the cruelty endured, there was nothing to contribute to the improvement of our, our lives there. Uh, we were fed uh, even poorly. Officers carry their daily duties as if they were prosecutors, judges, jurors, and executioners promoting violence uh, against those presumed to be innocent, where not even the guilty should be treated with such indignity. A quarter of a century later, the conditions have worsened. For decades, every level of government with the power to change this has lacked the courage to do so. Just over two years ago, I sat in the chambers of City Hall with dozens of other survivors of Rikers in, in watch City Council expired. take a historic, a historic vote to close Rikers and with that to commit to reducing incarceration, recognizing the humanity of incarcerated people and investing in communities that have been targeted by the carceral system. Finally, we urge this council to do everything in your power to make sure that the promises made in October 2019 are kept and we will need you to exercise your oversight power every step of the way to make sure the plans for borough jails stayed on schedule, that the jails on Rikers are emptied, not just closed, but also transferred out of DOC control as the renewable Rikers plan requires. And we need you to pass the laws that sit before this committed right now, like the legislation to end solitary confinement. We have the courage to look past the uh, the, the, the scaremongering tactics that have always been used to black progress to racial justice and human rights. With your leadership, we can ensure that in the next six years or sooner, Rikers Island and the Queen House and every decrepit jail in New York City can be part of our history instead of our present. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Crystal Gooding, followed by Condra Clark, followed by Edwin Santana. The time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Crystal. I'm a member of Freedom Agenda. Um, I'm here to briefly share my experiences visiting Rikers Island. As the partner of someone incarcerated, I can start by saying that although he's not deceased, due to the hurdles it takes to see him and keep him as an active father, many days it does feel like it. Since June of 2021, I have been able to visit in person. There were times that my children were forced to bring in one small bottle of formula, but at the same time, we got stuck in the visiting center for hours due to things happening in the jail. There were times we were able to bring water and a few more bottles. Nothing was uniform with our experiences and it all boiled down to which officer you ran into and how they felt that day. My son, who was only a few months old this summer, had to sit starving and hungry, locked inside the facilities for hours before we even got upstairs to our one hour visit. And then there was an equally long wait to leave after. Many of our visits started at 8 a.m. and we would not leave the building until 1 p.m. due to lack of staff. My son's single pamper allowed at that point was filled to the point of it being so uncomfortable for him. There have been times that officers would not show up to work and we sat on the transport bus locked inside waiting for someone to come by to let us into the facility. There was no communication provided to anyone. I've watched people have panic attacks on that bus. I recall my first time visiting Rikers Island in person when an officer, officer said to me that I was annoying B-I-T-C-H, because I asked questions in regards to the check-in process. He then randomly decided to cancel my 9 a.m. visit and reschedule me to 11 a.m. just because he could. Therefore, we sat in the scalding heat, myself and two small children. His exact words that were that he was in charge, and it made me wonder what type of things he was capable of doing to the people he's being expected to look over. I recall countless times I have to use my six-minute phone call to try to talk about my needs, the children, our home, I'm bills, sorry. and remind my partner that he's worthy of life. Can you imagine how hard that is? Maybe a minute per subject, and then if he has to tell me anything, he has about 15 seconds. Those times are even scarier when he's feeling depressed because you have six minutes to prove to someone that they are worthy of life. 
I'm here to really emphasize the need to decarcerate, advance, and strengthen the plan for the people, the parents, the children, the spouses, and the loved one being held on Rikers Island, the people who still have to come home and be a healthy part of society. Also, I'm here to emphasize the importance of borough-based facilities that can keep families closer and shorten the travel distance for many people. Lastly, I wanna stress the importance of putting programs in the community that can actually help people that are an alternative to incarceration. Jail should not be the one umbrella to all of the many issues people face in today's society. Thank you, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that story, but I, I appreciate hearing uh, the next steps that I think are urgent here to close Tigers Island. And thank you again for being here and testifying and sharing your story. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kendra Clark, followed by Edwin Santana, followed by Anna Pastoressa. Your time will begin. Can you hear me? Uh, there we go. Hi, uh, my name is Kendra Clark. I'm one of the vice presidents with Exodus Transitional Community. We want to thank you all uh, for letting us testify today. Um, we work on Rikers Island right now. I have over 40 staff that are on the island. And just this last week, um, I, I came into the office because some of my staff had been pepper sprayed while they were working on the island. So I'm getting the background of the story. And yes, the incarcerated individual was in a space that they were not supposed to be. They got into a staff area. They stole food from a staff area. And as they were running out the door with food, this was DOC's response, was to pepper spray, right? So when we're talking about culture change and talking about design, like let's get to the crux of it, right? This, this was a guy who clearly was hungry and he was taking food. Yes, he was not where he was supposed to be, but sure our response have been to pepper spray to where all of my staff got pepper sprayed as well. Um, when we're talking about de-escalation rooms in the new facilities, then we should not have an ESU, nor should we be using pepper spray. Pepper spray is not a de-escalation tactic, right? You're not going to be able to change culture if we're gonna to continue to use punitive and harmful measures that hurt people. Um, we went, we had the privilege in 2019 and the Department of Corrections was part of this trip to go to Europe to see other uh, models and how they were infused. There was complete culture change that was revamped in Europe, and these are in maximum security facilities. So again, it's very frustrating to keep coming back to a jail and talking about how we can't make change in a jail when other um, countries are able to make significant changes in maximum security facilities, right? And they've done that through the import model. The import model is a power sharing dynamic. Part of the reason why we've had such an issue during COVID is the officers have not shown up. They have unlimited sick time. And, and they cannot get fired, right? Per their contract with the union. What, what would have, how would this have looked I'm different afraid. if we would have had the import model? If we would have had employers who were working to train folks and get them into jobs upon release. If we had a school system on the inside that actually matched the outside, right? We could infuse community and, and different staffing structures into the Department of Corrections that would actually lead to culture change. You're asking a department that's had the same culture for almost 100 years to change without infusing anything new into it, and that's part of the problem. So, you know, we're really asking that this borough-based uh, jail facility proposal moves forward, but it's also, you know, taking a second look at it and making sure that we're really meeting the root causes of incarceration and staffing the facility in a way that is actually gonna meet those root causes and support people. Um, and we wanna thank you for today. Thank you, nice to see you and thanks for the testimony. Thank you, next we will hear from Edwin Santana followed by Anna Pastoressa followed by Akila Tomlinson. The time will begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edwin Santana. I am a New York, a New Yorker and a proud New York uh, Bronx resident. And, and I'm, I am also a longtime leader in the movement to close Rikers Island. I'm also a community organizer with Freedom Agenda. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to express my distaste for how New York City treats its detained citizens. I have spent time in multiple New York City jails and there is no doubt in my mind that Rikers Island or rather Torture Island needs to be demolished and the boat needs to be sunk. 
These jails are unfit to live in and they both have a culture of violence that are killing its residents. More importantly, this needs to happen now. I was last incarcerated in those jails many years ago and they were horrible then and they have only gotten worse. Our detained citizens are dying, at least 14 people this year alone. There's, there's truly no time to waste for this. I testified at uh, City Hall two years ago when this council uh, courageously stood on the side of human rights and voted yes to the, to the plan to close Rikers in response to, of course, the organizing by survivors like myself. But what happened to that energy, right? What happened to that? Today, I urge the council to do three things. Number one, move forward and expedite the construction of the borough-based jails and continue to work with advocates to make sure these detained centers will be more humane and fit to live in while people are having their day in court. This will have to include serious efforts to end the Department of Corrections reign of terror. They cannot be allowed to operate these replacement jails the same way they operate them now. This council must use all your power to make sure that that don't happen, including immediately passing legislation to truly end solitary confinement. Number two, let's continue to fight against mass incarceration by investing in communities that need it the most. I live in the Fordham area of the Bronx, and I believe my neighbors will agree with me that we need to help the unhoused individuals sleeping on the streets instead of incarcerating them. And we also need to better our, our, our schools. Number three, you must hold New York City's current administration as well as the upcoming administration accountable. Advocates will need your partnership to make sure the plan to close Rikers stays on schedule, that promises are kept and laws are implemented correctly. Rikers Island as well as the boat as all everybody testified here today, it knows that it's a human rights crisis. Let's do the right thing, everybody, and shut them down. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that point. Thank you. Next, you'll hear from Anna Pastoresa, followed by Akila Tomlinson, followed by Arlene Parks. Good time, Hi, my name is Al Hi, my name is Anna Pastoresa. I'm a leader in the Close Rikers campaign and a member of Freedom Agenda. My son spent six years on Rikers Island waiting for trial. And I visited him every weekend undergoing stressful trips, abusive treatment and witnessing abuse inflicted on incarcerated people and visitors by offices of Department of Corrections. During the six years of my son's each time we had a court date, we pleaded with the prosecutor, the judge, and my son's defense attorney to move my son closer to home. In that case, we were begging to move my son to the Manhattan Detention Center, AKA the tombs, which would have been a much easier trip for his loved one to visit. My son's defense, at defense attorney refused to visit my son on Rikers Island. And during the six years, he never had a meeting with my son to prepare for the case. Many people are still and will be involved in the criminal legal system even after closing Rikers. Therefore, I believe that building borough jails is a very good plan and a very good solution to transition from hell to more humane detention centers. It would have been a much less traumatic experience for my son, his family and friends, and perhaps his lawyer to visit him near the court and near home. The fact that speedy trial was ignored for six years and the court system did not apply the Sixth Amendment, how can anyone think it's okay to be locked up on Rikers Island, tucked away from civilization to make it easier for DOC to inflict abuse? I believe that having detention centers near courts in each borough will facilitate speedy trial, visit by professionals, by family members, and will establish some sort of humanity to people who are waiting for trial and hopefully not for six years. The tombs, unfortunately, is also a decrepit dungeon. It lacks natural light, program space, and suitable visiting areas. The only thing good about that jail is that it's not on Rikers Island. It must be torn down and replaced with a facility is that is truly designed with human beings in mind. If we don't treat people with dignity while waiting for trial and continue the abuse, we will only deepen the incarceration rate to make the New York and the US the capital of human rights violations. 
I ask city council to ensure that everything possible is done to accelerate the closure of Rikers and completion of the borough jails and to use your power to hold DOC accountable for their abuses, to make sure that the new jails are built differently and also run <laughs> differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for testimony. Next, we'll hear from Akila Tomlinson, followed by Arlene Parks, followed by Jane Robert Semper. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you hear me? Yes. I hear you. My name is Akila Tomlinson, and I'm a member of Freedom Agenda. I'm here to speak as someone who has been deeply impacted by incarceration with family members who are currently and formerly incarcerated. I urge this administration and the next to move forward with the plan to shut Rikers Island down and build borough-based facilities, investing in communities that have been under-resourced, reducing incarceration and building these facility facilities for a much reduced jail population will help to restore the humanity that has been lost since Rikers Island has opened in 1932. The conditions in Rikers are deplorable. People are sleeping in cramped cells the size of a regular closet, the floors are filthy with rotten met with rotten food, maggots, urine, feces, and blood. People are using plastic sheets for blankets, cardboard boxes for beds, and bags as toilets. While conditions have reached a new level of crisis this year, they have been terrible for decades. My brother was held in Rikers for over 600 days waiting for his case to go to trial. Every day my brother had to stay on high alert because every day he felt threatened. Unfortunately, my brother is not the same after the time he spent on Rikers, and it saddens me to say that my relationship with him has drastically changed as a result of everything he has been through. He is not the same person I admired growing up. Rikers Island is not only traumatizing for the people who are incarcerated there, it also affects the people that visit their loved ones. My experience as a visitor left me with the feeling that I didn't want to go back. I felt violated when they had to search me and humiliated. Every time I went to visit my brother, I had to wait over an hour before an escort decided to bring him to the visiting area. All of New York City's jails are run by DOC, which is an agency built on a model of punishment and have proven themselves unable and, and unwilling to end the culture of violence that consumes Rikers. We propose that once these new facilities are built, the city must commit that they operate differently as well. That can include more oversight and accountability for DOC is immediately, and also more comprehensive solutions like dissolving DOC and replacing them with a new agency that has a different mission and different training and job descriptions to go along with it. Rikers Island is a human rights violation that should have ended a long time ago. The mayor and city council have the power to change this, and I implore that all of the steps possible to expedite this process are taken which includes issuing requests for proposals for all contracts by December 31st, 2021. While the city current plan is to close Rikers by 2027, it could be done faster if the city made that a priority and past, and past years should show that there is now no time to waste. While New York City continues to incarcerate anyone, people have the right to livable conditions, to be in proximity to their lawyer, their families, and access to the services that they are entitled to. The jails in Rikers can never meet this standard and the existing jails in the boroughs are also just as decrepit and unfit for human hab habitation. Borough-based facilities must be, must be implemented expeditiously. It's a step in the right direction to restoring humanity. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Arlene Parks, followed by Jane Robert Samper, followed by Tracy Gardner. The time will begin. Okay, good morning, Chair Powers and, sorry, I'll just speak up. and the uh, committee members. My name is Arlene Parks, and I am the chair of Community Board One and the vice chair and CEO of the Diego Beatman Mutual Housing Association in the Bronx. And I am here today to oppose the siting of the jail at 320 Concord Avenue. My community is in the midst of a cycle of unprecedented crime and gun violence without any help or assistance from the city of New York or law enforcement due to the collapse of the criminal justice system and the COVID pandemic. 
the brazen and the sheer number of shootings and men dying in the streets in my community and in Mount Haven is tragic and unacceptable. It is the direct result of decades of disinvestment in the district coupled by the recent criminal justice reforms and the absence of a proper equitable and fair policing plan for the district. This has resulted in emboldening violent career felons that putting at risk the safety of innocent law abiding residents, families and workers that live and work in the district, including at PS 65. There have been so many shootings along the corridor where the city wants to cite the jail that we have had the need to request NYPD vehicles along the corridor to assist. There are NYPD vehicles posted at Brook Avenue and 139th Street, Willis Avenue and 137th Street, St. Anne's Avenue on 136, uh, uh, on St. Anne's Avenue on 136th Street. Time has expired. These, this is due directly to the shootings where people have been shot and killed. And in spite of NYBD presence, the shootings and the crime continue. This is not normal. The lives of Mount Haven residents matter and is just as important as the tourists that visit the city of Manhattan and the residents that live in Manhattan. No one should have to work, go to school, yet alone try to live in this environment. Uh, and if the city, uh, the city of New York cannot address what has taken place with respect to the, the drug dealing, the open gambling, the quality of life issues, guns and violence. Now, I can assure you that citing a jail at 320 Concord Avenue will significantly exacerbate conditions in this community. The silence by the city government in regards to the gun violence and people getting killed that has taken place speaks volumes to our businesses, our residents and the workers. The city's plan to cite that jail at 320 Concord Avenue undermined over two decades of committee plan, community planning and efforts to root out crime and, and stabilize this community and the district and the financial investments of hundreds of millions of dollars to revitalize and rebuild this neighborhood. Residents working together with the federal government develop strategies to deal with the crime in the neighborhood. The city and the state's recent policies have effectively undermined the work and effort of this community. Finally, we are asking the city of New York to listen Listen to the businesses, listen to the residents of the community and throughout the district and not cite the jail at 320 Concord Avenue. Work with us so we can find another better location and instead focus on rebuilding Mont Haven by investing in NYCHA. This district has the highest concentration of NYCHA developments, 22. Invest in our schools and bring in the best and the brightest educators. Invest in after school programs, invest in mental health programs, invest in parenting programs, and invest in workforce development to reduce the poverty in the district. And finally, and most importantly, fix the criminal justice system. Taking those facilities off of Rikers Island and simply just building another building in our community without fixing the criminal justice system, including fixing the Department of Parole, ensures that our community will be entrenched in poverty and crime and violence in perpetuity. Thank I, Ms. Parks, I just have to have you come this to the opportunity to address your committee. Thank you. I think, we, I think we got you muted, but nice to see you again. And I want to give you extra time because I know you are uh, a large representative of your community up there. And I know we've discussed this in the past. Um, I want to give you extra time, but we have lots of folks who are uh, here as well. So thanks. 
Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jane Robert Samper, followed by Tracy Gardner, followed by Jenny Velas. The time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Robert Sampure, and I am the coordinator and staff attorney for the Women's Pretrial Release Initiative at the Legal Aid Society. In the last month, our clients at Rose M. Singer Center have suffered enormously from the city's sudden and misguided decision to close the facility by transferring these women to state prison. This is not decarceration, and this is not the way to close Rikers. I have come before this body on previous occasion and discussed the documented vulnerabilities and extreme trauma that the majority of women in city custody have experienced. These transfers are disruptive to their treatment and their support systems and are further traumatizing. This entire process has been haphazardly and poorly planned. Contrary to the belief of the governor's office, we are not given notice of when our clients are transferred and we are not given an opportunity to adequately counsel them on these transfers. Some women are even given absolutely no notice and given five minutes to pack as quote, same day transfers. These transfers are having a devastating effects on our clients' cases and right to counsel. Several clients have been transferred in the middle of assessment for alternative to detention services, delaying their release from jail and connection to vital supportive services. These transfers are also significantly diminishing our, our communication with our clients. To date, the systems that Doc said would be in place for our communication are still flawed and ineffective. Transfers are resulting in some, in some of our clients not being brought to, to their court appearances, denying them their right to be present at their court proceeding. Additionally, since entering st uh, state custody, several women have reported being threatened by correction officers who are telling them things like, you're in state custody now, no one is going to hear you, only confirming our clients' fears and further exploiting the long history of abuses in state custody that have gone underreported, underinvestigated, and underaddressed. At least one of our clients have even reported being assaulted by corrections officers since her arrival. While we all want to see the closing of Rikers Island, this is not the way to do it. The city's inability to meet their obligations is placing a dangerous and undue burden on the most vulnerable population in their custody. Over 125 people detained at Rosam Singer organized and signed a petition to demand their transfers be stopped. Yet the state and city refused to hear their voices and instead chose expired. to further traumatize an already vulnerable population. Decarceration has to be the city's expired. focus. Simply moving women further from their support networks and their, and their legal teams does not make communities safer. It does not make women safer. The only way to ensure women's safety um, pre-trial is to make sure that they are in the community with their families, connected to supportive services and therapeutic services in the communities while their cases are pending. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tracy Gardner, followed by Jenny Velez, followed by Nigel Kuros. The time will begin. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Gardner, Senior Vice President for Legal Action Center. Since 1973, the center fights discrimination against um, people with criminal legal system involvement, addiction, mental illness, and HIV and AIDS. I'm an appointee to the Commission on Reinvestment in Communities Impacted by Rikers Island, and I'm a member of Freedom Agenda as an organizational partner and as someone with a loved one who has been hurt by Rikers. We founded the ATI and Reentry Coalition in 1984 at the state level, and it consists of nearly a dozen um, direct service and advocacy organizations that together help more than 20,000 New Yorkers every year to avoid incarceration. And for those who've already been to jail or prison, successfully re-enter society upon their release. Rikers, known nationwide for its inhumane and dangerous conditions must be closed. We have a forthcoming blueprint that provides concrete steps to lower the jail population and provide community-based supports for individuals diverted or released from incarceration. Increase in dedicated funding for ATI and reentry supports, robust network of community-based healthcare and social services providers. We can no longer rely on Rikers as a community healthcare provider. Ample access to truly affordable housing, significant reduction in barriers to jobs and educational opportunities for formerly incarcerated individuals, and the elimination of voter suppression tactics. New York City must also increase support and funding for harm reduction programming like continued distribution of naloxone, safe syringe exchange, and safe consumption sites. These are proven tools to provide alternatives to incarcerating people who can be better addressed by services in the community. Finally, and most importantly, incorporating the priorities of those most harmed by the criminal legal system in the reinvestment plan is key to its success. People with firsthand experience with broken policies and incentives we are trying to change. <clears throat> These are the tools New York City must use to close Rikers and set an example for the rest of the nation on how to reverse our status 
as the world's leading incarcerator. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Jenny Velas, followed by Nigel Curas, followed by Joanna Wheel. Your time will begin. Thank you, everyone. My name is Jenny Velos, and I am community organizer in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. For years, grassroots and community groups, criminal justice advocates, formerly incarcerated individuals, and other advocacy organizations, including NOPI, have worked together to push the city to close Rikers Island and reinvest in the communities most directly impacted by incarceration. The current conditions at Rikers underscores the need for its closure. Among the most egregious conditions are sewage backups, faulty plumbing resulting in the lack of clean, running water, and a lack of basic necessities. Additionally, Rikers Island jails are built on a toxic landfill plagued with methane leaks and contaminated soil, which negatively impacts the health of those incarcerated on the island, as well as correction officers, medical staff, and other employees. This is an environmental justice issue that deprives thousands of New York City residents of basic human rights, like access to water and sanitary living conditions. The city has a responsibility to stop this by implementing Local Law 16, which requires the transferring of land, buildings, and facilities of Rikers Island from the Department of Correction to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, with the entirety being transferred no later than August 31st, 2027. However, the city has been negligent in its implementation. The first land transfer was supposed to occur no later than July 1st, 2021, but the city waited until August to transfer a small portion of unused land. Instead of transferring the inactive facilities on the island over to DCAS in the fall, the city reopened EMTC, which was initially closed and should have been part of the initial land transfer. With OBCC currently open and the reopening of EMTC, the city needs to prioritize decarceration by closing OBCC and transferring the land by the end of the year. These jails should have been among the first pieces of land transferred and no plan has been shared to transfer more land by the next deadline in January. Many of the same environmental justice issues at Rikers underscore the urgent need to replace the current borough-based jails. The borough-based jails are currently unfit for human habitation, including problems with excessive heat, mold, poor ventilation, limited natural light, and living spaces so small, they do not even meet standards mandated by the state. Replacing these jails is necessary to stop this human rights crisis and the city must move quickly. The history of Rikers Island is one of inhumane and environmentally unsafe conditions. And we now have the opportunity to turn something that has had such a negative impact and legacy on our city into something that serves as a step towards restorative justice. Nopi calls on the city to transfer land on Rikers to DCAS and issue the, RS, the RFPs for all construction contracts for the borough-based jails by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nigel Kiros, followed by Joanna Wheel, followed by Eileen Marr. Good afternoon. Uh, my, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nigel Kudos, and I'm an attorney and field organizer at the Innocence Project. Uh, the Innocence Project is a national organization that works to exonerate uh, the wrongfully convicted and reform the criminal legal system to prevent future, future injustice. Um, as a member of the campaign to close Rikers, the Innocence Project is deeply grateful that the city council has recognized the overall negative effect that Rikers has had on the people of New York City uh, disproportionately people of color. The Innocence Project hopes that this process will mitigate the abuses and tribulations of those people held at Rikers who are presumed innocent, including some waiting, awaiting trial for years. Uh, with the anticipated dramatic increase, uh, decrease of pre-child detention in New York City, we hope to see fewer, fewer people pleading guilty to crimes they did not commit just to avoid time in jail. The nation's more than 375 DNA-based exonerations demonstrate the problem. More than 10% of them proven innocent through post-conviction DNA testing had originally pleaded guilty to serious violent offenses. When you consider the number of people who pled out when the charges and stakes were, are lower, we believe an enormous number of innocent people plead to lower level felonies and misdemeanors. Those individuals that are housed on Rikers Island, many of whom are presumed innocent and are subjected to terrible conditions isolated from legal representation and the support of family and loved ones and access to courts. They are often shuttled on long trips back and forth to court dates, housed in deplorable conditions and subjected to violence at the hands of others being housed and even correctional officers themselves. And of course, current conditions on the island are nothing short of a human, of a human rights crisis. These issues can be remedied by the construction of new, more centrally located borough-based facilities with more program space and more humanizing design. 
the existing borough-based jails, namely the Boat, the Tombs, Brooklyn House, and the Queens House are unacceptable. If we care about human dignity, decency, and due process, we cannot allow for people to continue to be jailed in any of these facilities, which are all in decrepit conditions, well past the shelf life, and as we have seen, breeding ground for more exposure and infection with, of the coronavirus. Uh, so we, i just like to thank you. Uh, just moving forward, uh, replacement borough-based jails is, is urgent. Uh, the city should take all steps to expedite this process, including issuing requests for proposals for all construction contracts by December 31st, 2021. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. Next, we'll hear from Joanna Wheel, followed by Eileen Marr, followed by Danielle Gerard. The time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Joanna Weil, and I'm a senior researcher with the Center for Court Innovation. The center supports the borough-based jails plan, and we urge council to use its authority to help the city reach the finish line on schedule in 2027. Rikers closure hinges on safely reducing the city's daily jail population from its current total of over 5,400 people as of November 17th to 3,300 or fewer people. Offering a path forward, the Center for Court Innovation teamed with the Littman Commission to release a comprehensive jail reduction roadmap this past July. Our report includes almost 40 data-driven recommendations to significantly and safely reduce its jail population. Conservatively, we estimate that our proposed strategies could bring the daily jail population to 2,700 people, as stated earlier by outgoing director of the Board of Correction, Meg Egan. Above average implementation could actually yield even greater jail reductions. If policymakers took action, all our strategies would require no more than two years to reach full implementation, and many could be put into place in a matter of weeks or months. We also recognize that the next mayoral administration and council membership may wish to further refine the process to close Rikers and open the borough-based jails. To this end, we recommend three guiding principles. First, reaffirm the current timeline. Moving the goalposts may incentivize inaction while the conditions at Rikers Island remain unchanged or worsen. The current timeline for 2027 still affords six more years to finalize a jail construction plan, implement it, and safely reduce the jail population. Second, allow for flexibility on the borough-based jails. The current plan remains achievable, but if necessary, the recent Vital City report points to other options for realizing the same outcomes. For instance, by transferring up to four state-run facilities in Manhattan and Queens to city control. While this alternative proposal is by no means the only one policymakers could land on, it provides a starting point for contemplating any future revisions. Third, finalize the jail plan swiftly. I'm Over the next over the next year to begin construction on schedule at the end of 2022. Additionally, there is no known opposition to the transferring control of the island from the Department of Corrections to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services or to reinvesting in historically oppressed communities. However, the work of the Community Reinvestment Commission has undergone significant delays. We suggest council exercise its oversight capacity to facilitate the commission's progress moving forward. Finally, the reactive and violent culture at Rikers Island must be prevented from transferring to the borough-based jails. This cannot be an afterthought, but must permeate the planning, design, programming, and staffing of the new jails from this moment onward. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, thanks for being here, and thanks for the testimony. Next, we'll hear from Eileen Marr, followed by Danielle Gerard, followed by Kelly Grace Price. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, my name is Eileen Marr. I'm a member of WCJA and the Justice for Women Task Force as well as Freedom Agenda. And I'm also a survivor of Rikers Island where I spent 420 days. Well, I've been pleased to hear people during this uh, hearing testifying about their attempts to move swiftly when it comes to closing Rikers, I'm still troubled. Initially, the borough-based plan to house the women in Queens is unacceptable. This plan, while noble, Yes, is unacceptable. It is our belief that the women who are detained receive their own single standing detainment center in Manhattan, not only because women have the lowest amount of active cases in Queens, but because a Manhattan based single standing facility would facilitate ATI's in house programming and services, as well as a convenient and simpler route for families 
and especially children to visit with their mothers. Despite being detained, women, like all women, are the backbones of their families and community. A facility located in Manhattan would be ideal, would be ideal in allowing the women to function in said role while fighting their cases. This would aid in also facilitating HPIs and, so, and creating solid and meaningful discharge and release plans, thus aiding in ensuring much lower recidivism rates and keeping families intact, not hidden in some extra space out in Queens. There are two ideal locations in Manhattan that could be utilized right now, the former Bayview facility in Chelsea and the former Lincoln facility by Central Park. We are witnessing that, oh, I apologize. <laughs> um, they could be uh, they could be utilized right now with minimal renovations, rather than keeping the detained women on the island, or which is awful, even more awful, up at bed. The time is so expired. We are, we are currently witnessing that moving the women who are not convicted of a crime yet to a state prison has been futile and cruel. This is increasing their likelihood for PTSD, clinical depression, and a myriad of other health and mental health problems. Not to mention they are now further from the community and court facilities. I can say this as a survivor of both the prison and the jail systems. This is a step backwards, two or three steps backwards, rather than the forward leaps and bounds we should be making. So again, I'm imploring you to following, I'm imploring you to following a mass relief utilize one of the Manhattan-based facilities for our mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunts, and friends sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Next, you'll hear from Danielle Gerard, followed by Kelly Grace Price, followed by Leah Faria. Your time will begin. Thank you, Chair Powers and staff. My name is Danielle Gerard. I am a senior staff attorney at Children's Rights since 1995. We have been a national advocate for youth and state systems. We are also a member of the New York City Jails Action Coalition and the Young Adult Task Force. Borough-based jails are a necessary step to address the long-running human rights crisis on Rikers, but they are not sufficient. We urge you to force the city to substantially reduce the jail population now to fewer than 3,300 people continue meaningful and continued oversight of the points of agreement and legislation related to the jails, including substantial investment in community resources to address unmet needs, demand accountability from DOC and COBA, and ensure that young adults get the attention and resources for which we have been clamoring for years, and solitary confinement. This must be the council's immediate priority. Please pass council member Drom's bill to ensure a true end to solitary confinement and not keep in place such Orwellian named substitutes as RMAS. Make sure that every community organization that works with people released from Rikers has a presence on the island now to establish meaningful contact before release. Begin planning now to have programming, education, recreation, and mental health services available for young adults across all borough jails this requires significant input on the design. Research shows that young adults up to age 25 are still developing, are incredibly impressionable, and require unique programming to meet their needs. Now is the time to plan to provide easily accessible programming automatically to all young adults upon intake and never to be used as an incentive. Now is the time to plan for making education available in congregate settings and easily accessible for all young adults and for any incarcerated person who chooses to study. Please focus on the hundreds of young adults in the system who consistently do not get enough programming, education, mental health care, and even food as young adults themselves recently shared at a meeting of the Young Adult Task Force. I refer you to the testimony for more detail. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here. Next, we'll hear from Kelly Grace Price, followed by Leah Faria, followed by Bria Agard. Time will begin. Hi, this is Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. Thank you, Chair Powers and Council members for allowing me to appear via Zoom today and share my comments with you. I wanna address a couple things. I wanna uh, quickly run over uh, the bill that's scheduled to be heard today, uh, intro 903. 
Chair Powers, you might remember in April 2018 during a criminal justice hearing, uh, I spoke specifically about how when I was arrested and incarcerated and released that I was given checks by the Department of Correction and sometimes by the NYPD that were marked do not cash uh, on the bank account so that I was never able to get that money back. And I asked specifically for any legislation that addressed the return of funds post incarceration to address this issue because those of us that are unbanked, I'm banked now, but at the time in 2011, when I was released, when I was unbanked, I was unable to cash those checks because I didn't have a bank account. Now, any other person that's given a check can just walk into the check that that, the bank that that check is issued by and cash the check with ID, but the DOC and the NYBT specifically mark their accounts, those checks from those accounts do not cash. That's an issue that has to be addressed in the legislation. Uh, I didn't mean to spend so much time on that. I want to um, echo what I've heard today from the Legal Aid Society and from uh, my colleague at the uh, Women's Community Justice Association calling for an end to this horrible plan to move people to Bedford. Um, I've submitted extensive testimony to the BOC and to the council about the harms uh, that are happening. Uh, look, at the end of the day, the city's going to get sued for this mess and every woman that's transferred is gonna get a payday. It's gonna be a mess. Um, it's gonna lock people up for years in court, but at the end of the day, at least some people will get a monetary reward. It's going to happen. Um, the, it's already in the works. So honestly, it, it's not a done deal. Um, and there's a it's couple of other lawsuits. I want to just quickly say that I was shocked to hear um, Margaret Egan's actually put on the record today that the Board of Correction has not been included in any of the borough based jail planning when it's specifically in their charter to have oversight over all capital spending and planning. Um, I think that this is a pattern that the mayor, um, we all know the mayor has obfuscated the board's role and undermined the, the board's authority by its by wonking with the appointment process. Please, if there's anything I can urge the council to do, make your final appointment to the BOC before the end of this term. You've had an open appointment now for a year. You had two for a few months there, but there's still an open appointment. Also, um, urge the judiciary, I believe that they have an open appointment, and make sure that the appointment process going forward is not monkeyed with. Um, I've testified extensively about how this mayor is monkeyed with the appointment process. Please make sure that this practice is not carried over into the new administration. I'll submit my written testimony. Uh, again, I wanna thank Margaret Egan. I'm sorry to see you go. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, Godspeed to you. Thank you. And we'll take a I'll look at the bill and relative to your suggestions and appreciate that feedback Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Leah Faria, followed by Bria Aggard, followed by Candy Johnson. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, Chair Powers and all of the council members. My name is Leah Faria, and I'm the Women's Community Justice Association Task Force and Community Organizer. WCJA is led by justice impacted women and service providers who launched the Beyond Roses campaign to close the Rose M. Singer Women's Jail on Rikers Island. Our movement was created because the women and the gender expansive population of Rikers Island were often treated as an afterthought. We advocate for diverting as many women as possible from Rosie's and securing a new permanent centrally located and humane facility for those who remain. On October 13, 2021, Governor Kathy Hochul and Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the transfer of nearly all women from Rikers to Bedford and to, to Connick Correctional Facilities in Westchester. They committed to the move being temporary, which is critical because these state prisons are 40 miles outside of New York City and incarcerate those who have already been convicted, while 90% of the women of Rikers are awaiting trial. Currently, the only permanent arrangement, arrangement for women is the city's borough-based jail plan. It places them in a new facility with men that is located on the outer edges of Queens and scheduled to open in 2027. When the city council voted to approve the plan in 2019, the points of agreement stated the city would explore the feasibility of moving the women's facility to a different site. In light of the transfer, a new plan is needed to bring the woman back to New York City as soon as possible to a humane, accessible facility that would not replicate the condition that, conditions at Rikers. 
former New York State judge Jonathan Littman wrote in the New York Times that three New York State run prisons in Manhattan sit empty and underused and one should be swiftly converted into a facility for women. We echo Judge Littman's call to bring back mothers, daughters, and sisters by using one of the Manhattan sites, Edgecombe, or Bayview Correctional Facilities as a permanent standalone center for the women of Rikers. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Bria Agard, followed by Candy Johnson, followed by Reverend Dr. Chloe Breyer. Hi, Tom, good we'll afternoon, begin. Chair Powers and members of the Committee of Criminal Justice. My name is Bria Agard and I am a Tau Fellow interning with the Women's Community Justice Association. In the past several months, there has been increased media coverage concerning the horrors of Rikers Island. The facilities on Rikers and DOC have proven their inability to effectively rehabilitate and serve the individuals being held within its walls. It is essential that any replacement facility must support individuals' needs instead of traumatizing and generating further harm and frankly should not be run by the DOC. At YCJ, the central mission of our Beyond Rosie's campaign is to permanently close RMSC and to decarcerate female and gender expansive pretrial population to below 100. When I started at YCA in early, in early September of 2021, there was about 316 people in custody at the RMSC and their average length of stay was 233 days, which is just under eight months. On November 16th of 2021, there was 253 individuals within the span of two months, and the average length of the stay has increased to 274 days or just over nine months. As the city and advocates have worked tirelessly to decarcerate, we have failed to support those with more serious charges who, as a result, have increasingly long lengths of stay due to their court backlogs. Jails are not designed to hold people for long periods of time. One of the main criteria used to establish borough-based sites was the geographic location of centrality. When looking at data concerned for borough of charge, the most women consistently come from Manhattan followed by Brooklyn. YCJ is advocating for centrally located standalone sites, preferably in Manhattan. Regardless, as women and gender expansive people are being moved to Bedford Hills, it is important more than ever to begin construction or renovation of the state and city owned buildings to ensure that the move is temporary. We must continue to move forward with the plan to close Rikers to build safer, smaller and fair borough based facilities especially as women are now being hold, held at Bedford Hills. It is essential to ensure that this move is temporary and is as short and as possible. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Next, we will hear from Candy Johnson, followed by Reverend Dr. Chloe Breyer, followed by Apostle Onelove Chica Alston. The time will begin. I thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. My name is Candy Johnson and I'm a senior youth advocate at Youth Justice Network. After nearly 18 months of being unable to access Rikers Island due to pandemic restrictions, we were finally able to return to Island in September. There's an ongoing humanitarian crisis on Rikers Island, including the death of 14 people in custody this year alone. Our staff has been on the front lines, navigating a return to Island amongst deteriorating hygiene conditions, a new intake procedure, increased violence and alarms, and lack of DOC staffing. Every day we feel the importance of in-person connection and relationship building with youth who have had a year of isolation and ongoing worsening conditions. YJN stands today with community and family advocates and acts the council and the city to act with urgency to keep black and brown young people alive. A commitment to close Rikers Island has been made by the leadership of the city, and it is essential that commitment is honored and that the line in the sand doesn't continue to move. The current situation for the approximately 450 incarcerated young people be between the ages of 18 to 24 on Rikers Island has been and remains extremely serious. The closure of Rikers Island, including the Rose M. Singer Center and the boat, is urgent and non-negotiable to address the long-running human rights crisis in New York, so more needs to be done in effort and in, in it needs to be done to invest and support young people impacted by the justice city system citywide. We call on city to decarcerate urgent, urgently. There were reductions in the overall New York City jail population in early 2020 due to COVID-19 pandemic. However, since that time, the jail population has steadily increased. The conditions in all the jails on Rikers are no less of a public health threat than the pandemic we're living in we need to still fight to keep this on the front page. 
We need to put in place a tangible su supportive infrastructure so that when young people are released back into our New York City neighborhoods, they may be able to make a life and future for themselves. The time is expired. The time immediately after release from jail is critical. Young people are often left without stable housing or income resources and need support to stay focused. Investment in community resources will reduce the chance of recidivism and increase decarceration efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. Chloe Breyer, followed by Apostle Only Love Chica Alston, followed by Susan Shaw. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Chloe Breyer. I'm the director of the Interfaith Center of New York and associate pastor at St. Philip's Episcopal Church in, in Harlem. I also live next to the Lincoln Correctional Facility about a block away. Um, and it's a fixture of our neighborhood. My first visit to Rikers Island was in 1997 as a uh, uh, clinical pastoral education student doing my CPE at Bellevue Hospital. I went uh, with some other medical students over to Rikers. And at the time it was e evident even back then that the culture of violence and impunity was, uh, was well underway with deaths that summer because uh, people there were not sent off the island to get adequate health care. We're calling, I'm joining the voices to call for the contracts of this borough-based uh, jail to, uh, to happen this year. And I'd like to add that as a clergy person, uh, knowing or concerned with the sparking of, of moral imagination, uh, the narratives that we tell ourselves, not just as individuals, but as a city and as a community are very important. And we saw this across uh, the role of symbols is important in that sense as well. We saw in the early 90s when um, Eastern Europe and the tearing down of the Berlin Wall really began a new stage of a movement uh, towards freedom and democracy in people in that part of the world. It was also an important symbol that indicated a new beginning, a new self-determination for people in the former Soviet bloc countries. And I think it is time then for the walls of Rikers to come down for a new beginning for New York City in a moral sense, and one that takes a substantive step towards improving our justice system. Uh, I want to conclude by saying that the city council needs to keep its, its word um, and to build these borough-based jails and close Rikers Island so that we don't let the pandemic, which has already wreaked havoc in our community, have another victim. And that would be uh, a victim uh, in the sense of taking us off track to a better and more just city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for waiting, being here. Next, we'll hear from Apostle Only Love Chica Alston, followed by Susan Shaw, followed by Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. Good time, we'll begin. Good afternoon. Um, can I be heard? Okay, great. We hear you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I want to start off with a scripture from my faith tradition. Hebrews 13, three says, remember those in prison as if you were in prison yourself. Remember also those who are being mistreated as if you yourself felt their pain in your own bodies. Good, good afternoon. My name is Apostle Only Love Chica Alston and I'm the racial justice organizer at the Interfaith Center of New York. I'm also the founder of Prophetic Whirlwind Ministries and I've been a resident of Harlem since 2007, but I was born and raised in East New York, Brooklyn. As a faith leader whose stepfather worked as a corrections officer on Rikers Island, I'm urging today that the jails at Rikers Island be closed because people are dying. We also need to reduce incarceration and shrink the capacity of the jail system while ensuring that the, that the conditions are humane for anyone who remains incarcerated. It is extremely urgent that we move forward with replacement borough-based jails. 
The city should take all steps to expedite this process, including issuing requests for proposals for all construction contracts by December 31st, 2021. While New York City continues to incarcerate anyone, people have a right to livable conditions in proximity to their lawyers, family, and services. The jails on Rikers Island could never meet this standard. And the existing jails in the boroughs are also decrepit and unfit for human habitation. Our incarcerated brothers and sisters are made in the image of God and they deserve humane conditions while incarcerated. Impacted people must be able to- expired. Thank you. Impacted people also need to influence how the borough-based jails will be built. Thank you so much and good afternoon. Thank you, thanks for being here. Next, we'll hear from Susan Shaw, followed by Reverend Wendy Calderon-Payne, followed by Eric A. Goldstein. Good time, we'll begin. Good afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Susan Shaw, and I'm the Managing Director for Racial Justice at Trinity Church Wall Street Philanthropies. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today. As part of our commitment to end mass incarceration in New York City, Trinity has vigorously advocated for the closing of the jails on Rikers Island and replacing them with smaller and more humane borough-based jails. At the same time, we support the implementation of policies and initiatives to safely reduce the city's jail population to no more than 3,300. For a number of years, Trinity Church has funded the work of the Lippman Commission, as well as many of the organizations that are working closely with the commission, the city council, and the administration to ensure that the city makes good on its promise to close Rikers by 2026. During this pandemic, however, we've grown increasingly concerned about the strength of the city's commitment to close Rikers and fully honor the plan that was passed in October 2019. It's been disheartening to see attempts to walk back certain portions of this plan, to reduce the budget for implementation, and to delay the agreed upon timeline. We cannot go backwards. The ongoing humanitarian catastrophe that has unfolded on Rikers cannot continue. This decrepit penal colony is a public health abomination. The conditions are irreparable. 14 New Yorkers have died while in custody of the DOC this year, and so many more are suffering from unconscionable conditions. Corrections officers are suffering too. We've also heard that female corrections officers are, being, are reported being attacked. Simply put, Rikers Island and our city's existing network of jails will never be able to protect the health and safety of those who are detained with them. So we ask that as we prepare for an enormous change in leadership, that the incoming administration and new city council fully commit on this plan to close Rikers by 2026 and move forward with the design and construction of the borough-based jail. Required. And do so with the expertise of survivors of Rikers and others with lived experience. The only important exception I offer is to heed the well-informed calls of WCJA and the Beyond Rosie's campaign to move the women to one of the state-run facilities in Manhattan instead of housing them in Queens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the testimony. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne, followed by Eric A. Goldstein, followed by Walter Wally Nash. Your time will begin. Hi, uh, I've had some technical difficulties and I just lost my testimony, but that's okay. Um, my name is Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. I am the executive director over Bronx Connect since 2016. We have worked tirelessly with community advocates to see the hellhole that is called Rikers and the barge that is really a slave ship in the Bronx to be closed permanently. Um, we do not believe that these represent the progressive values of New York City. We do not believe that uh, these situations and these facilities support the redemptive purpose for the young people that are, and the young people and adults that are caught up in the system. Um, and we just really need to say to city council, we desire you to move forward on the RFPs and to not pull back before December 31st, issue those RFPs, 
move the process forward. It is just unacceptable that I have young person after young person after young person who can bluntly tell me that they spent seven months, eight months, nine months in Rikers and never had a visit from a lawyer. Now, why is that? It's not that these lawyers who could be making a lot more money in Wall Street don't care about them. It's that you cannot spend seven hours to visit one person when you have a caseload of 100. So we are asking that the city council use its power to bring this process forward and not backwards. Now we understand that the mayor may adjust one or two or the new mayor may adjust one or two things, but I do believe that the community has spoken in spite of many loud voices that they want and we want our families near to care for them and to support their redemptive uh, process and their uh, their changing of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Eric A. Goldstein, followed by Walter Wally Nash, followed by Abdullah Bald. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the committee. I'm Eric Goldstein, New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Of course, NRDC agrees with the Lipman Commission's conclusion that closing the notorious jail complex on Rikers Island and advancing a modern system of smaller jail facilities in the five boroughs is a moral imperative. It'll end one of the sorriest chapters in the city's criminal justice history. It'll facilitate enhanced efficiencies in, criminal, in the criminal justice system, and it'll create a once in a lifetime opportunity to completely re-envision the use of 400 acres and transform this island of shame into a showplace of sustainability and green jobs. Look at what would happen if the borough-based jails are completed on the legislative time frame as the renewable Rikers legislation envisions. Rikers will become a centerpiece of solar power and energy storage. This could enable the city to close one or more aging, inefficient and pollution generating peaker plants in the boroughs, which are primarily located in already overburdened lower income communities of color. A reimagined Rikers Island could host a modern state of the art wastewater treatment plant. This would lead to closure of several older treatment plants in the boroughs, opening up store shorefront parcels for new uses that meet community needs for recreation, affordable housing, green space and resiliency. And finally, the establishment of a modern borough-based jail system the National Incarceration of Rikers could allow for the land on the island to be used for a major expansion of food and yard waste composting, keeping a major portion of the city's waste stream out of our landfills, a major source of climate destroying methane emissions. Finally, this renewable Rikers vision will have another important benefit. It could bring a measure of justice to those who have disproportionately been affected by Rikers Island jail operations by providing new opportunities for jobs and job training programs for former Rikers Island detainees and by offering economic benefits such as energy to neighborhood residents that have suffered directly and indirectly for night, uh, from Rikers operations. In sum, implementation of the borough-based jails program will demonstrate how criminal justice reform, social justice, and environmental protection can go hand in hand. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and I always thank you for your commitment to all our large citywide goals here and uh, keeping us focused on them. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Walter Wally Nash, followed by Abdullah Bald, followed by Nadav Gazit. It's time over again. Good afternoon, my name is Walter Wally Nash. I uh, am a resident of Concord Avenue. I have been a resident of Concord Avenue since 1944, where I was born on Concord Avenue. And I'm talking concerning the uh, 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 jail prison that will be built on Concord Avenue. First, I want to call your attention to that I worked for the government of New York State from 1963 till I retired in 2001 for the State of New York Department of Mental Hygiene. And during that time in 1963, the governor came up with plans of bringing community-based mental health to the community. To this date, uh, that has not been implemented too well. They entrusted the city of New York 
to care for the mentally ill. And as you can see, the city of New York is not able to, con to care for all of the mentally ill that the state of New York has dumped out on the street. As far as the buildings are concerned that I heard about in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx of the state institution, yes, they are closed. And as you can see, the mentally ill are out on the street. You can use those buildings for other purposes. Uh, as far as the, the, the new programs for the Department of Correction, you cannot put new wine into old, no, you cannot put old wine into new bags. The, 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 the overall administration of the government has not changed. You cannot have a new jail without new programs. And the new program should have started years ago. To say that you're gonna now move the jails to the community. You had the jails in the, the community in the beginning. And you should have come up with the programs. What you need is to change the government's way of thinking. Because if you'll notice, nothing has changed from 1963 to this present moment for the state, nothing for the city has changed about the jail system. And it won't change no matter how you have it in the community until you change the thought process of those in charge and put the money where your mouth is. All right, thank you. Thanks so much. Next, we will hear from Abdullah Bald, followed by Nadav Gazit, followed by Michael Johnson. Your time will begin. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I just want to highlight that it is important that these elected officials to listen to the people who live in New York City, especially in the South Bronx. I just want to highlight that our youth we feel like stuck in everything because everything has been said here. We all agree that we need to close records, but the alternative that is proposed is not a sustainable alternative for the future of this city, for the future of this borough. New York City is the most powerful city in the world. We can do better than this. And this is a high stake that we give into the next mayor, but I think the policy, the lobbying that they just wanna impose something, that is already, the, the mom, a mom cannot walk in the neighborhood without seeing a needle of drug. The mom cannot send their school, their children to school safely. Okay, we see this reality every day. We agree on closing records, but the alternative that having those small um, uh, jails is not a sustainable alternative because the failure that we were, the city was not able to, 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 to handle one place, how can the city will be able to handle five places with all this logistic? What is the logistic in place? So please, let's review this together and not repeat the same mistake again and again. It is time to listen to people who live here and who suffer every day. Let's give chance to the people of the South Bronx on the young people to have better future. Most people who on this panel, I believe they don't live maybe in New York City, maybe they live somewhere else. But if you live in New York City, you listen to the news, you know that the data speak for itself about how it is imperative to act positively and to act smart. It's time to act smart. We have the tools, we have the human resources, let's use them in a wise way. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Next, you'll hear from Nadav Gazet, followed by Michael Johnson. Your time will begin. Uh, thank you, sorry. I was not planning on, on submitting a uh, testimony, but um, I would definitely want to voice an, uh, an opinion that I don't think has really come up in this hearing yet, um, which is that there is an option, which is to close Rikers without closing, without opening new jails. You know, new jails are needed in order to deal with the issues that have been brought up. New jails are just, there is no such thing as a humane jail. They are not needed. What is needed is to invest this money in housing, in education, in meals. Um, 
and it is definitely not into creating these new jails. There would just be more places of violence and harm, and they're not needed. We just need to close records. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Next, we'll hear from Michael Johnson. Your time will begin. Thank you. My name is Michael Johnson, the co-founder of South Bronx Unite. I'm so pleased to be a, uh, to present after those two last two presenters. I think this is an historic moment we have here. We, I think we all agree that Rikers should be closed. I think we know it's an humane system that's incarcerating people of color in those, those, in those structures. That what's happening there is an injustice. We cannot, cannot solve an injustice by creating more, a, a new building uh, that supposedly is gonna be more humane that will end up being more money spent on the, the criminal injustice system or the prison injustice system is not justice. We're not putting money where we are, where we need to put money to solve this problem that we have societal, a societal issue here. We all agree Rikers is a, is a bad idea, has been a bad idea from the start. The Baines Detention Center was a bad idea. We should not be housing our men and women of color in these structures. It's no, no different in slavery. So what we have to do is put money into making sure we do alternative conservation, into programming for extra, extra ed educational opportunities. Let's heal our society. Let's, let's, let's do humane justice here. But building a new building does not solve the problem. Putting billion dollars to the, to the problem is not solving it. Let's be creative. We have an opportunity right now to tell our children that we did something landmark here. We closed this institution, but we also worked at change in this institution. Change the institution that throwing billion dollars at a new building. It's not revolutionary to put lipstick on a pig and call it something different, but a pig. Let's change this, uh, this situation today. We have an opportunity as people of consciousness. Now I know my time is running out, but I need 10 more seconds. We can't put billions of dollars in our system where we spent in expired. this community. I know my time is expired, so but give me one minute or 30 seconds. We spent, we're building a new 40 precinct, precinct uh, police department in our neighborhood, spending $57 million. But now it's ballooned to $68 million. In our community, we, we're putting money into renovating Horizon Youth Detention Center and Crossroads Detention Center. Planned at $170 million, ballooned to $300 million. The Bronx Courthouse was supposed to be $325 million, now it's $400 million. When will we stop and start investing in our communities? We have an opportunity to do something different. Let's think outside the box and really solve this problem and stop trying to put lipstick on a pig and think the problem is the building that people are being housed in. They do not need to be housed. Let's bring our people home. If they're nonviolent offenders or waiting for their day in court, let them come home. We're already reducing the bed count. Let's do something revolutionary here. It's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we will try to hear from you now. Okay, we'll turn to Melissa Vergara. There you go. Hi, how are you? My name is Melissa Vergara. Um, I'm the mother of a young man who's currently on Rikers Island where he has been for the past seven months. And I am also a member of Freedom Agenda and the Treatment at the O Coalition. My son has a diagnosis of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and he also has a pyramid to the frontal lobe of his brain. Since my son has been on Rikers, he has encountered immense violence and inhumane treatment. My son has been slashed in the face, stabbed, and had to get part of his finger reattached after a faulty door was um, slammed on his finger. My son, when my son first got to Rikers Island, I tried to contact the facility to inform them of his mental health history. And as my son cannot arc articulate this information, in June, I called OBCC and spoke with the Captain Lewis and gave her a brief synopsis of my son's mental health disorder. Her response to me was, oh, so you're calling me to tell me your son gets mad. 
I then proceeded to say, you know, to try to explain it to her. And she said, ma'am, call 311. I don't know anything about mental health. Later that day, my son was pepper sprayed and left to his cell for six hours as a punishment for his symptoms. On June 15th, after not hearing my son for four days, I received a call from another person incarcerated telling my son was deadlocked in his cell with no mattress for all that time. On June 21st, my son was slashed in the face and told by an officer to write a statement just saying he fell off the bed. On August 15th, when the correctional officers were protesting outside, every one of my son's housing area was locked in their cells with no access to food. On October 21st, my son was moved to a different housing area after informing and informed the captain of the dangers of being placed in that house. The captain responded, I don't give an F about what happens. And within an hour of being in that house, my son was stabbed and did not get any medical attention for over three hours. And on, then October 31st is when he had to be rushed to Bellevue Hospital um, due to the incident with his finger. Um, whenever I contacted Rikers Island, I have encountered nothing but bad attitudes and extreme unprofessionalism from captains and officers. The people in these positions are allowed to behave in any way they please with no repercussions. In August, I was waiting on a virtual visit for my son for over 30 minutes. I witnessed a female officer, a male who was incarcerated, time, a derogatory time. homophobic slur. A word that most people would lose their job if they were caught staying at work. Whenever I have contacted Rikers Island, I have encountered bad attitudes and extreme unprofessional from officers and captains. These people are in positions and are allowed to behave in any way that they please with no repercussions. How can, how can people who behave this way have the authority to punish anyone? How can this be allowed for so long? If they treat people on the outside, I just say, how do you think they're treating people in there? My son has a comprehension level of a seventh grader. Would anyone in here find talking to a, a seventh grader this way, the way they speak to people on Rikers Island, acceptable? Rikers should have closed many years ago. It is a death sentence and detrimental to the physical and mental health of the people incarcerated there. That has been proven as in 2021, 13 people have died while in custody. The facility itself is uns unsanitary and toxic. My son has regularly seen mice in his cell and roaches. One of the most popular cities in globally, New York City, has allowed its own residents to be forced to live in these conditions. The city council must expedite plans to reduce incarceration and close the Rikers Island jail and decrepitate ones in the boroughs. But you also have to make sure that with the improved physical conditions of the borough jails comes a complete overhaul of the Department of Correction. And you can't wait until 2027 due to the human lives that are at risk. 14 deaths in 2021 will be 98 by 2027. You must incarcerate, rehabilitate, reinvest, and save their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I don't see any other hands, so I will turn it over to Chair Powers to close the hearing. Thank you. And thank you to everyone, including folks at the end, for being with us here today and to talk about not only the urgency to close Rikers Island, but what comes ahead. And as we close uh, uh, the chapter on this administration at the end of the year, I think it's essential and important that we continue the conversation that the council started uh, before I got to the city council about the uh, plans to close Rikers Island, the horrible conditions there, the plight of the people that are in custody, their families and the stories that they have to live with and uh, a lot of work that we have to do in the criminal justice system here in New York City and of course throughout the state and the country as well. So I really wanna thank you everyone, the uh, input and the stories and the feedback on the plan as we move forward is really important and essential as in addition to us getting critical information and updates on where the plan is in the uh, pipeline today. And no doubt whether it's in one administration or one council or others, the work continues to make sure that we have a safe, humane, and fair criminal justice system, including where and how we are housing people that are facing trial here in New York City. So once again, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the staff here at the City Council for their work and their efforts here. Of course, my staff as well uh, for their ongoing and continued work around this. And thank you to everyone in the public who become uh, and very important advocates for their communities and, and for the work that we're doing here and provide us with really critical in, insights and input. So with that being said, I want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving and want to thank everyone for being and joining us here today. Please stay safe during the holidays. And with that, we'll adjourn our hearing today. Thanks, everyone. The recording stopped and